So it's my pleasure to introduce the next speaker and the um, second keynote speaker. So Dr. Bjorn Dahlbach is a professor of blood coagulation research at Lund University in Malmö, Sweden. He received his uh, medical degree and PhD at the University of Lund, where he rose through the ranks in the departments of medicine and clinical chemistry. From the earliest days, uh, Bjorn has led research on the molecular mechanisms of the uh, protein C anticoagulant um, system as well as complement, focusing on the roles of um, particularly activated protein C, protein S, in the degradation of coagulation factors 5 and 8. His studies in coagulation also led him to investigate links to other um, biologically important um, defense uh, systems, as I mentioned, um, particularly the complement system. Bjorn has been interested in the genetics of thrombophilia and described APC resistance caused by factor V Leiden as the major inherited risk factor of thrombosis. More recently, he's been involved in the elucidation of a mysterious autosomal dominant bleeding disorder from East Texas, which we'll hear more about today. Actually, Bjorn has this magical way of finding intriguing, out-of-the-box discoveries that have really a huge impact on clinical medicine. So it's always a, a joy to watch what is coming next. So he's always been an active member of the research community, participating as a thought leader on the ISTH Council, the Swedish Royal Academy of Science, and as a member of the American Society of Hematology. I mean, he's won numerous awards um, for his research, uh, which are too many to count here. So I welcome Bjorn. Thank you very much, Ed, uh, for the kind and nice introduction, and uh, thank you for the invitation. It is a really a great uh, honor and a pleasure to, to be invited uh, to this symposium. Uh, I started many, many years ago and uh, uh, in 77 in the lab, and at that time Earl Davy was really the giant uh, in the field. Uh, so it is indeed a pleasure. Uh, when I was also invited, uh, I thought, what should I talk about? Uh, and um, came up with Factor V, which has been with me really an interest since uh, the late 70s when I started in the lab. And uh, it is also a field that has been an interest to, uh, uh, to old Davy. Uh, they cloned the Factor V. And, um, made very important contributions. So uh, what I will talk about today is some of the uh, w previous uh, work on, on Factor V and then end up with this uh, sort of new story uh, which puts Factor V uh, or a new role for Factor V as an important regulator for blood coagulation and there are then some new insights into this. Uh, this building here is where I work. I work on the top floor here. Uh, it's a nice building. I come from Lund University, but work in Malmö, which is the most southern city uh, uh, in, in Sweden, with a climate similar maybe to Vancouver. We don't get much snow in the winter. So anyway, uh, this is my uh, simplified view of the extrinsic pathway of complement uh, where tissue factor on extravascular cells uh, come in contact with blood, factor 7A binds, forms this very stable complex that can activate with a very rapid turnover either factor 9 or factor 10. A lot of factor 9, 10 are formed then the rest of the, of the pathway really continues on the activated platelets, providing the perfect negatively charged surface for the assembly of the prothrombinase complex with factor 10A, factor 5A uh, being very important cofactor, factor 10A is the enzyme, prothrombin is the substrate, and there is a high turnover number. Uh, the the first um, uh, thrombin that is generated, feedback activates factor V, recruiting uh, fact the pro cofactor I will talk a little bit more about, from blood cleaving, um, generating then the active form. And the same with factor eight, 
uh, releasing it from von Willebrand factor and where it can then form a complex with factor 9A and factor 10 is the substrate in this case with a very high turnover, uh, turnover rate. So in this uh, really factor 5 here plays a very important uh, uh, role as a cofactor in the, as a pro cofactor uh, and as a cofactor to factor 10A and without the factor 5 there this reaction really goes several hundredfold slower. So factor V circulates as a pro cofactor. Uh, it's a single chain molecule uh, composed of different domains. Uh, the green part here will constitute the active molecule. This big piece in the middle is uh, like a big activation fragment uh, a very simplified model here where the three A domains are coming together uh, with the two C domains and the B domain here protruding. Uh, and in the B domain there, are, there is a positively charged region and a very highly negatively charged region. And uh, Rodney Camira and his associates have suggested that these two regions interact and keep factor V as a pro cofactor. And uh, the uh, molecule is really m modulated by proteolysis and what I will describe is that it's modulated, it can be modulated both into a procoagulant but also into an anticoagulant uh, uh, function. Just starting with the uh, activation by thrombin uh, there are three peptide bonds that are needed to release the B domain and uh, the first two here are the kinetically favored uh, and uh, occurs at very little thrombin but um, only generates a partial factor 10A cofactor activity illustrated here by these titration curves in a prothrombinase assay. Uh, we have uh, uh, if the full length uh, factor V has a very low uh, li affinity with a, with a high KD for uh, factor 10A uh, and we, after the cleavage of these two the, the KD decreases, the affinity goes up at least tenfold but it's not until this very last cleavage here uh, occurs that the really high affinity uh, factor 5A or the interact high affinity 10A binding occurs and the prothrominase. So it suggests that this is a sort of a modulated process in itself. So I, 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 I took the liberty of starting just telling how, how great it was to be here and also that I selected factor V as a topic as I know that we have a, a shared interest in factor V and you have made uh, very important contributions to the factor V field. So, uh, and I will also then uh, tell a little bit about the new possible anticoagulant functions of factor V in addition to these procoagulant activities I, I just described. Uh, here, the sequential activation of the molecule. Uh, but this site here is actually quite difficult to cleave and it's only when you could say that when coagulation is really determined that it should go uh, that that cleavage occurs. So it, it needs relatively much thrombin, whereas the first other two uh, do need, are very kinetically favored. So I will not talk more about the procoagulant aspects here, but uh, just uh, uh, stress the point that uh, factor 5A and 8A are also the targets for an important regulatory system, the protein C system. Protein C system targets the two cofactors, whereas other systems target like uh, all the enzymes. Uh, TFPI we heard about uh, inhibits the very initiation phase of the, of the extrinsic pathway. Uh, but activated protein C um, 
And I, I think uh, Ed has had a great interest in thrombomodulin. Uh, it's an amazing molecule and an amazing story discovered more than 30 years ago by uh, Esmon and uh, Owen. Uh, and what thrombomodulin is, is a transmembrane protein present on all endothelial cells, uh, really. Uh, uh, mainly in the uh, vasculature and maybe not in the brain. I, I, I yeah, anyway. Uh, but it, in principle, it's present in all endothelium. Uh, and if thrombin is generated in the vicinity of endothelium, thrombin binds with very high affinity and converts or modulates thrombin into an anticoagulant from a pro to an anticoagulant. So when thrombin is bound to thrombomodulin, it cannot coagulate blood, it cannot activate platelets, it cannot activate factor V or eight, or it cannot convert fibrinogen to fibrin. So thrombin is converted into a very potent activator of protein C. And there is a rapid turnover generating active protein C. And the proteins, act, protein C is uh, uh, sort of a family member of the coagulation factors, but it has, has sort of turned again against coagulation and become an anticoagulant rather than a procoagulant, but otherwise it's very homologous. So the name of this modulator of thrombin was very, I think, well picked when uh, Esman and Owen called it thrombomodulin. So an activated protein C, together with its cofactor uh, and other vitamin K dependent proteins, cleaves several peptide bonds uh, in the heavy chain of factor V. This leads to a loss of structural integrity and loss of function. Now a surprise comes because when we look at factor VIII degradation and factor VIII inhibition uh, by activated protein C, not only protein S is an important cofactor, but the intact or circulating form of factor V actually serves, as an, it serves in an anticoagulant role here to, uh, to regulate factor VIIIA. And in particular, factor 8A, when it's in its uh, complex with factor 9A, uh, the so-called 10A complex, where protein S and factor 5 works as synergistic cofactors with activated protein C uh, to regulate this uh, complex. I, I will come back to that a little bit also. So, uh, this kind of anticoagulant activity of Fact5 we, we discovered while working on, on what Ed said, the APC resistance, this uh, uh, thrombophilic risk factor, uh, where we initially had the uh, hypothesis that a cofactor was missing from the patients that were APC resistant. And when we purified the cofactor with traditional methods, it turned out to be Factor5 we purified a factor that I had actually then purified already several years ago, so designing really uh, exactly the same purification procedure twice and realizing after designing the procedure, it must be factor five we are purifying here. We did that several years ago already. But anyway, that led us to this conclusion that there is an anticoagulant activity and it works as a cofactor to activate the protein C in the degradation of 8A. Uh, and this is illustrated by this uh, uh, experiment where we have, we have a fully assembled 10A complex with factor 9A, 8A. Uh, we add activated protein C and we add protein S. Uh, and then we add increasing concentration of factor 5. We measure the remaining factor 8A activity and as you see here, the factor VIII activity is lost depending on how much factor V we put in. Whereas APC and factor V alone are not so efficient, 
I don't have uh, the with protein S here, that, that, that would be also in, uh, up here. So it has this uh, ability to stimulate APC, but, uh, but mainly together with uh, protein S. Uh, and the intact form of factor V in this reaction is actually cleaved by APC at these sites. And these cleavages uh, stimulates the anticoagulant activity. So activated protein C sort of stimulates its own cofactor in this way. So, so then the question is, uh, what about factor 5A that would not have this uh, domain here. Uh, is factor 5A also a cofactor that doesn't seem to make sense? It, it makes sense that factor 5, which is, you know, when co there is no coagulation, anticoagulant pathway should dominate. It makes sense that factor 5 could be a cofactor. But what about factor 5A? Uh, and factor 5A in, in this respect is not a cofactor, just a substrate for APC cleavage. And we were interested in, in seeing, uh, the, following the conversion of 5 to 5A, when is, which cleavages leads to the loss of the anticoagulant activity. And we made all kinds of mutants that you see here. This um, mutant here can only be cleaved here. So this is before and after thrombin activation. So this, uh, whereas this mutant can be cleaved at both these sites, after thrombin cleavage, it would generate this molecule. This last cleavage at, at position 1545 could not be cleaved. This one can only be cleaved at 1545, whereas this uh, is completely resistant to thrombin. And then we look which ones of these do still work as a cofactor after thrombin cleavage? And as you see, uh, the only one that does not uh, work as a cofactor after the cleavage is the one that can be cleaved at this uh, arginine 1545, the one that fully converted factor 5 to 5A. So, whereas um, uh, all these mutants that cannot be cleaved at 1545 you see that the factor 8A activity is lost, just like I showed before for wild type factor 5. So this cleavage here, when factor 5 is fully converted to 5A, the anticoagulant activity is lost. Just going back quickly, thinking about so this molecule here, which has just been cleaved at these two sites, would still work as an anticoagulant. So it suggests that the B domain is important. So what part of the B domain is important? And with a number of mutants, uh, we uh, uh, change the B domain. In this case, the B domain is replaced with the B domain from factor 8. In this case, the B domain is completely lost. And here we still have a small piece of the B domain. And this is the wild type. And only these two are uh, functioning as cofactors, suggesting that this piece here, very small piece at the end, is what is active. That is the area that was so negatively charged. Uh, whereas uh, the B, eight domain, eight B domain cannot do anything, or when the B domain is completely lost, it has no function. So really, factor five uh, can be proteolytically processed into either a procoagulant by thrombin and factor 10A, and that procoagulant factor 5 is sensitive to activated protein C uh, and leads to a loss of function completely. But in situations where coagulation is not activated, that is when the endothelium is still intact, activated uh, protein C is generated, uh, then factor 5 uh, follows a different route. It can be activated or cleaved by activated protein C 
and this we call effect 5 anticoagulant uh, is uh, then uh, uh, supporting the degradation of factor 8 but if thrombin is generated that will uh, be cleaved and lose its activity so really proteolysis drives the functional uh, functionality of factor 5 so uh, at this point, uh, I will show you the sort of more traditional, uh, I think the, we have uh, almost the whole cascade there, uh, or actually the whole cascade, but uh, I have so far only talked about the extrinsic pathway that leads to 7A tissue factor activating either factor 10 or factor 9. I had on the first slide uh, and forming the 10A complex with factor 8A forming the prothrombinase complex at 10A and 5A on the phospholipid surface, activating prothrombin to thrombin and thrombin feedback activating these cofactors. But uh, at situations where endothelium is intact, thrombin binding to thrombomodulin, activating protein C, and protein C then downregulating the system and in the case of factor 8 a degradation, factor 5 plays as a cofactor. Uh, uh, up here are the factor 12 and 11 uh, initiation pathway that we heard previously about. And uh, here protein S, the reason I worked on complement is really that I found this complex we see for binding protein and that sort of pushed me into complement for many years. Um, so, uh, under normal circumstances, uh, these two systems are balanced, but in uh, situations where with uh, genetically uh, increased risk of thrombosis, so-called thrombophilia, uh, the balance is shifted more into procoagulant direction. This means a lifelong increased risk of thrombosis. A lifelong increased risk that can, of course, be uh, further added by, uh, <coughs> uh, by uh, environmental factors. Uh, and uh, the family where we di discovered APC resistance is this one. This particular individual uh, had multiple thrombos thrombotic episodes, and many family members, as you see, had uh, also had thrombosis. And the interesting thing with this, I cannot go into the details of how we really came to this conclusion. It took a long time and many years, but finally we, we made this experiment when we added activated protein C in a regular clotting time, an APT time, and we found that this individual we had identified first was uh, resistant to the anticoagulant activity of protein C whereas the control shows the, uh, the prolongation of clotting time. Uh, and, uh, and the explanation for this is that uh, there is a mutation at, that changes uh, arginine 506 with the glutamine. Uh, this is what is called FACT5 Leiden. It uh, leads to a loss of uh, one of the APC cleavage sites at this site. And, and that tips uh, the balance uh, between the pro and anticoagulant forces. Uh, and I think the interest, an interesting aspect and a surprise is that the same mutation also then affects the factor 8A degradation because this, this site here, the 506 site, is important to stimulate the uh, factor 5 cofactor activity. So the fact 5 Leiden is also a poor, poor cofactor in this system. So one mutation in factor 5 affects both factor 8 and factor 5 degradations. Another interesting aspect, I think, of this mutation is that it's very common in only parts of the world. And that is uh, mainly where people from Europe uh, uh, are populating, uh, you know, uh, dominate or present. So in Japan and China, uh, original inhabitants of Australia, in Africa, 
and, uh, and original uh, inhabitants uh, in America. The mutation is not present. Uh, and, and the, whereas in southern Sweden, which unfortunately is missing in this picture here, uh, as you see, as, as well as Denmark. So I think this is, this is actually after the climate changes. <laughs> but I cannot show this picture in Denmark. Anyway, it's very uh, uh, up to even 15% of the population. And the explanation is that this is the founder effect. This mutation has only happened once, estimated by other scientists that maybe around 20, 25,000 years ago, one individual was mutated and uh, the mutation is kept. Uh, and it probably has a survival benefit uh, we looked at all pregnant women in Malmö during uh, a year and it turned out that 11% uh, of them had the mutation and those women actually had shorter uh, hospital stays, they bled less, so they were uh, actually uh, strong healthy uh, women. Uh, they had a slight increase of the venous thrombosis uh, but um, uh, I, I think that in the history of mankind, bleeding after the first delivery was really what killed women. And uh, of course, if you survive your first pregnancy, you can then have uh, more children. And that may be the reason why it has been kept and even to, to these high levels in the population. So, so the factor five, which then is both uh, uh, pro-coagulant and anti-coagulant, uh, uh, a mutation um, in factor five causes uh, thrombosis. It's the most common genetic risk factor for thrombosis. Now I will turn to another story, and, and that is, this is a story that started also many years ago. It was quite actually difficult to work out the mechanism here, so it took some time. It, uh, it's a collaboration between a group in Texas, uh, Lisa Vincent was the student, Diane Milovic uh, led the group, and Tracy uh, Benson was a, a clinical doctor, and uh, these are the people in my lab, two technicians that I worked with uh, over the years uh, on this project, Sintran and Rusika Levaya. Um, so, uh, this family, or the, well, I will read the title because it's really an intriguing pathogenic mechanism of an autosomal dominant East Texas bleeding disorder. So the East Texas family was uh, found, uh, uh, as you expect, in East Texas, and it's a big family where all these individuals here are affected family members. They have an uh, increased bleeding tendency. Uh, the pattern is clearly autosomal dominant with 22 affected family members. This family uh, was, I was not involved in, in work. It was first described in 2001 uh, where they uh, described this family and what they had found is summarized here. So autosomal dominant, moderately severe bleeding. Uh, the indivi affected individuals had mildly or prolonged prothrombin time and APT time or APTT. But the levels of all clotting factors was normal. Uh, and they could make a linkage study and the, the uh, disease was linked to the factor V gene and uh, when sequencing six known SNPs and one new SNP was found, it predicted a serine to glycine replacement. So they concluded that this could not cause this uh, disease. So, um, and really uh, f finished up and published uh, this. Now, factor V uh, is well known. If you have deficiency in factor V, you can have bleeding problem. But these individuals had normal factor V level. And you cannot really think about an autosomal dominant 
or it's difficult to envision an autosomal dominant pattern for factor V. Why uh, is this, uh, was this uh, um, new SNP ruled out? Because uh, it uh, was in the uh, B domain, uh, it was located here, uh, so it, it was thought that it could not affect the 5A. But Lisa Vincent, the student, took up this work uh, and uh, she could actually show that this mutation uh, in the B domain uh, activates an alternative splicing site, a site that is actually present also in normal factor V. This is a predicted splicing site, but it's not used much as such. But this um, A to G mutation here sort of stimulated the splicing and 702 amino acids from the B domain was deleted, generating what we call a factor V short, which must have a very small B domain. Now from work from many people, this factor V would be, is, is expected to be very procoagulant, so it, it was very difficult to, in, to, to figure out how could this actually cause bleeding. Uh, but we, we, at this point I was involved in the work and we could test all family members to see do they all actually have this short form of factor V where they, they, has, they have this very small B, short B domain. And uh, Western blot was run on all family members uh, and uh, the presence of the, the mutation is indicated here with a plus absence of the mutation minus and as you see all those with plus have a short form of factor V <coughs> which is not a proteolytic fragment because it can react both with uh, antibodies to the heavy and the light chain but uh, you see that it varies also a lot the intensity and in particular you see that this individual here has a very weak band uh, and actually quite little factor V also, but very weak. So, so it varies, and just remember this particular one here. So the uh, f sort of laboratory evaluation suggested uh, that something disturbed the prothrombin time and APT time, but when we ran, when all the uh, factor analysis, you know, clotting assays were run, everything looked normal. So we uh, uh, set up a thrombin generation assay, which basically is that you follow the generation of thrombin in plasma, directly in plasma, after initiation with tissue factor, the whole system goes and thrombin is generated with a fluorescent substrate, you can measure the thrombin, and the dotted lines here are all the unaffected individuals. They all uh, have, give a lot of thrombin and that is inhibited then by antithrombin and other inhibitors. The affected individuals all have very poor thrombin generation except this individual which almost looks normal and that was the one that had the very weak band. So it suggested that the presence of this short form is really associated with the inhibition of coagulation. And we could show that that was the case by uh, immunodepleting the factor V from these individuals. Uh, these are the starting plasmas, unaffected and affected. When the factor V was depleted and factor V added back uh, either full length or the recombinant short form, they both looked perfectly normal. So. So we had made the trouble of making the recombinant short form of factor V and when we add it back to the factor V depleted, it doesn't do the job. So we were stuck there thinking, what, the, what is going on here? We, have, we made the factor V short, we, we could, I mean this was not the only experiment, we could prove that the factor V short in the patient plasma was really what was inhibiting the plasma uh, or clotting. But when we made it recombinant, it doesn't inhibit, so it works. But the conclusion here was that there, there, 
there must be an inhibitory activity associated with factor V, but the recombinant factor V short form does not uh, reproduce the inhibitory phenotype. And I was stuck there for actually many years and we thought about post-translational modifications and everything like that. Uh, but then I thought more about it and the possible explanation is one could of course be that the in inhibitory activity is an intrinsic property of this fact five short. Another possibility is that an other inhibitor associates with fact five short and that is what inhibits um, coagulation. So what uh, inhibitor could it be? And actually one of the first, first things we thought about was this tissue factor pathway inhibitor, uh, TFPI alpha, which has been in, reported to interact actually with both protein S and with factor, normal factor V in plasma, but, but with a very low affinity. But now we made an experiment that is one of the few experiments in the scientific career that works immediately. And actually it turns out to be what you think also. Because when we ran the, these, all these family members with their antibodies to TFPI, we see that all the individuals with uh, the mutation, they have very high levels of factor V giving this very TFPI alpha giving this very strong bands. Really except this individual that I mentioned before that had very little factor V short form e plasma. So it really uh, suggests that the TFPI is what, uh, what uh, inhibits the plasma and we made several experiments to prove this that I will not show. But the conclusion is that uh, the TFPI alpha is what inhibits coagulation here, even though the mutation is in factor five. What is the mechanism behind this? Uh, also, this uh, is uh, work I, I don't show, and it also fits very well with work that has been done by Alan Mast and Rodney Camire, uh, uh, and that was published a little bit after, after our report. Um, luckily, we got the, we, we came up with this idea in time and not six months later because then it would not have had this, you know, value of news. Uh, anyway, so the TFPI alpha has this very highly positively charged regions in the C-terminus. It can interact weakly with factor five, but it's not really known where it could interact with. The KD uh, has been estimated to around 13 nanomolar. But this short form of factor V only has the negatively charged region. And it binds TFPI with approximately 100-fold higher affinity. So TFPI really preferentially binds to this short of, uh, form of factor V. And that is what it really is uh, inhibiting and clotting. Uh, <coughs> the <coughs> conclusion from the, these Texas bleeding a family, as I mentioned, autosomal dominant, this mutation uh, induced alternative splicing. TFPI binds with high affinity. What I didn't say is that it, then the explanation why the uh, concentration is so high, we believe is that TFPI is retained in the circulation and that it gives a tenfold increased uh, concentration. And the reason uh, uh, is that TFPI in itself is a small molecule, 40 kilodalton. It's filtered in the urine unless it's bound to something. This uh, um, keeps it in the circulation and that inhibits uh, uh, coagulation. Now I think what really the in uh, a really interesting outcome of this was that we started looking into normal individuals and we could find the same complex but at much, much lower levels in plasma. But what we could find is that TFPI alpha, uh, at least 50% of TFPI alpha, when we immune precipitate plasma and look what is bound, it's the short form of factor V and also some full length factor V. So yeah, under normal circumstances, 
The TFPI binds to this very low amount of uh, factor V short that we have, and the rest binds to full length factor V, but with a lower affinity. Uh, just a few slides, uh, if I have time, that we, we are now interested in trying to figure out, does this really affect the TFPI function? And we want to elucidate if the binding of TFPI to this short affects the function, not only that it keeps it in circulation, but it could affect it. And uh, if the TFPI inhibition of thrombin generation is decreased when factor V is activated, uh, and the method we used was we took uh, either intact or thrombin activated recombinant factor V uh, short or this 702 uh, that should then either form uh, or we could see that the, after activation it doesn't form a complex. So we added these mixtures to factor V deficient plasma and tested uh, with either tissue factor or factor 10A induced uh, thrombin generation. And these are the results we got with the, after tissue factor initiation. So it starts with factor 7, uh, the, the thrombin generation. Thrombin, and what we did was titrate it in uh, TFPI. And these are just uh, sort of visual experiments, but if you see here with the, uh, with the ink, without TFPI and with the increase in concentrations of TFPI up to 8 nanomolar, we get, get complete inhibition when we add the unactivated factor V. When we do the same thing after thrombin activation, the inhibition is not so pronounced. But we see that without added TFPI, they are equally active. The same actually is true when we initiate with 10A, so directly initiate, we get a similar pattern with uh, more inhibition if the factor V is then intact, uh, factor V short compared to when it's activated. The thing is that this experiment can be tricky because as soon as clotting starts, the factor V short will be activated. So we are, have now made the mutants where that cannot be activated and are working on defining more properly um, if the factor V short affects the TFPI uh, activity. Uh, and I think the answer to that probably will be yes. So we... Um, the conclusion is that intact factor V was more e efficient the, in inducing both 10A and tissue factor induced thrombin generation than after thrombin cleavage. So this molecule here was more active than just the tissue factor alpha uh, when it was free. So when it's free here after activation, it has lower activity compared to this molecule here. So therefore, I think that we need to modify this uh, uh, cascade further. And uh, not only do we have factor V now in, with the protein C system, but this factor V short TFPI alpha complex that we have also normally, also we, I've added these small stars here, or asterisk, oh yeah, stars, or what do you call them? Uh, that probably, I think they inhibit both the initiation and the prothrombinase, and it illustrates that factor V has been sort of an interesting companion in the career. It has provided challenges and uh, surprises, but also rewards, I think. So uh, with that, uh, I would like to thank you for your attention. That was wonderful. Uh, I, I have a couple of little questions. Uh, I, I'm wondering if you have excluded the possibility that short f 
5 is activated differently than, than wild type 5, than normal yeah, 5. Yeah, we have, uh, we have looked at the activation by thrombin or 10A and it activates. Identical. Identical, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm also wondering if you have excluded the possibility that TFPI expression is also upregulated at the same time as possibly being sequestered by short. Not in this family, no, we haven't had that chance to, uh, to prove that. Mm. It, it seems possible because it, yeah, it factor be possible. 5 is not saturated. Yeah, actually the, the full length factor 5 is not saturated, but the short form of factor 5 is fully saturated, so there is no free factor 5 short. Very interesting. Yeah, so it suggests so, that it could be upregulated. Yeah, it could be upregulated, but on the other hand, it seems you know, it could be that FACT5 somehow induced TFPI uh, gene expression. Uh, because, but uh, I think another alternative that has been my hypothesis is that the amount of FACT5 short that is generated will trap the TFPI it needs to saturate the site. Because there is, when we had this the individual with the uh, that was lower in the short form, that had also lower uh, TFPI concentration. So it seemed to be like a perfect, uh, uh, perfect correlation between factor five short concentration and TFPI alpha uh, concentration there. So, uh, but we have not excluded that uh, somehow factor five could affect um, gene expression of TFPI alpha. We, we, that we have not, I haven't thought about that actually, and we haven't excluded uh, that possibility. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. So Bjorn, are you going to tell us how you're going to turn this into a, um, a therapeutic um, um, for thrombotic disease? Well, well only, yeah, I think that uh, it um, may be not for thrombotic, but maybe for bleeding. Because uh, the thing is that, um, and I think, I, I, I mean, I, I'm not working on that, but companies are working on that. Novo is uh, working on generating an antibody uh, that in, inhibits TFPI. Uh, and I think what such an antibody would do is also to remove this complex. Uh, and uh, if this complex is really what is the, the most active, uh, that could be beneficial not only for this family, but also like for hemophilia with inhibitors. And I think that that is what uh, uh, the plan has been for Novo, I think, to start with. I think uh, it's interesting also, there was another company that made a uh, clinical trial with a TFPI inhibitor. I don't, uh, what was it, an op optimer or, uh, I, I mean, some other kind of, uh, uh, but it had to be discontinued because it seemed to increase the TFPI concentration and activity. So it actually had the opposite effect and I think if that worked like uh, factor five, that it forms a complex and the complex is not then eliminated by filtration in the urine, then the TFPI concentration can go up. So I, I think you need to think about those aspects. I, I've uh, uh, thought about, you know, how could you make variants of this uh, factor five short uh, so it only inhibits uh, this or that, but uh, uh, haven't come up with any really smart ideas. <laughs> Time. Oh, you have two. Yeah. Oh, it's go first. Uh, I just wanted to ask this kind of simple question. Is the, uh, what is the percent now of that factor fibers member, membrane bound or at least uh, platelet bound, and does that change with age in these? Uh, yeah, actually, I don't know. They, of course, the problem with this family, in a way, is that it's in East Texas, uh, so it's not easy for me to to interact with them <laughs> directly. So, but uh, uh, but.
but so I don't know exactly. We haven't looked at the age correlation between uh, the amount of the short form with the age. So I, I don't know if that changes. Uh, I don't know the TFPI uh, literature enough to know if TF, TFPI alpha concentration changes over time because I think that TFPI alpha uh, levels are really determined by the amount of the short form of factor V. So an indirect way to measure the short form of factor V, which there are no assays available at present, would be to look at the TFPI alpha concentration. Because uh, if, the, if that increases, uh, for instance, or decreases over age, that could uh, uh, indirectly suggest that the fact, factor V uh, when it comes to if it's membrane bound or I mean factor five is uh, only membrane bound when uh, they um, when the negatively charged phospholipid membrane is exposed uh, I mean so factor five in itself uh, circulates uh, uh, not being bound to membrane but the amount uh, in platelets platelets also contains both factor five and, and uh, TFPI, and I actually ha have to admit that I don't know if platelets have the short form of factor V. We haven't come around to do that experiment to, to see that, but if that, uh, how that is regulated or determined, I don't know exactly. The factor V in platelet, I think that Ken <laughs> has been one uh, pioneer there showing that uh, uh, the fa factor V in platelets is, uh, is actually deriving from plasma and then proteolytically processed to some extent. So, so you, you, I think if I heard you correctly, the level of TFPI is much higher in this family. Yes, like a tenfold, tenfold higher. So is it that per se that is causing the bleeding or is it the fact that the TFPI is right at the right site because it's being bound by the five short? Uh, I, that, I think that is the question we are really trying to figure out. Is the, is the factor V uh, really working like a cofactor for TFPI? And my hypothesis, uh, belief is that it is. Uh, I, I think it is, uh, if you envision that the factor V short TFPI complex is bound to the negatively short phospholipid membrane and 10A comes. It, it, TFPI sits there, right there, to inhibit 10A. So I think 10A inhibition, but I, I, I would like to test even further to see does it affect the 7, 7A tissue factor already there, uh, uh, we, which I think it very well could, that somehow factor 5 also in the initiation brings TFPI to the right place. Now TFPI is also, I mean, this uh, alpha form is just a fraction of the TFPI that is, is present in blood. There are a lot of uh, uh, other isoforms lacking the C-terminus and a lot of TFPI is actually bound to LDL but only contains two of these uh, Kunis domains. So uh, I think that uh, the TFPI alpha is what is, is of interest here and that can also interact with the heparin like heparin sulfate like mole, or heparin like molecules on endothelium so for instance if you infuse heparin you will increase the tfpi alpha well i mean there. that would it, it ought to be straightforward to increase the level of tfpi alpha in the plasma by tenfold by hooking it to polyethylene glycol or something else to carry it in the circulation other than five short yes. and see mm. if you get the same bleeding. I think that if you infuse heparin, um, you get uh, an increased uh, TFPI alpha because it's liberated from, from the endothelium. I don't know actually what happens when you infuse polyphosphates. <laughs> Maybe it's doing the same. Uh, uh, of course, uh, heparin in, is more difficult because it induces bleeding anyway. So, but, but um, it's an interesting question, I think.
Jesus, where have you gone? Our next speaker is Dr. Susan Smythe. She is the uh, Jeff Gill Professor of Cardiology and the Chief of the Division of Cardiovascular Medicine at the University of Kentucky. She also has an appointment as a cardiologist and an investigator at the Les Lexington VA Medical Center. Susan received her undergraduate degree in biology from Mount Holyoke uh, College in Massachusetts and graduated with an MD-PhD from the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. After internal medicine training, she completed a cardiology fellowship at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York and again at the University of North Carolina. As a clinician and investigator, Susan's research focuses on the interplay between inflammation and thrombosis. Her work in the lab, which has provided many novel insights, has instigated clinical trials in acute coronary syndromes, venous thrombosis, and sepsis. She's received numerous awards, including the 2013 Jeffrey M. Hoch um, Award from the American Heart Association. So we're excited that she could find the time to join us. Susan. So it is a real pleasure to be here, and I want to thank Ed and the organizers for this spectacular day. Um, I've really enjoyed all of the talks. I have to um, uh, confess, though, in this audience that I view myself as more of an East Coast clotter. Um, I not only went to school in Chapel Hill, I was actually born and raised uh, just outside of Chapel Hill in a neighborhood that had one other house that belonged to Harold and Mary Roberts. And so from a very young age, I think I was destined to do work in thrombosis. That being said, um, the, the work that I want to talk with you about this afternoon really is looking more at atherosclerosis, although I have to um, admit that while we think the, the pathways and the phenotypes that we're seeing reflect atherosclerosis, it's very possible that there is a thrombotic component um, because I certainly view the, the atherosclerosis as really atherothrombosis uh, in, in humans. Um, but I want to talk with you about work that, that really now we're looking at an atherosclerosis, although it came out of our interest in understanding how blood cells interact with one another, with the endothelium and with the extracellular matrix to promote vascular disease. So some years ago, we got interested in a family of lipid mediators that signal by acting on G protein coupled receptors along cell surfaces. Uh, this family of lipid mediators includes lysophosphatidic acid, which is cartooned here in this figure, um, and its sister molecule, sphingosin-1-phosphate. These two lipids are present in extracellular, um, in extracellular fluids, including plasma, and they affect signaling through a family of G-protein-coupled receptors, uh, some of which are structurally very similar, um, some of which are, are structurally distinct. Uh, these receptors, the ones, for example, for LPA, there are now six uh, identified LPA receptors, activate all of the classic intracellular large G-protein coupled signaling pathways. So they activate Rho, phospholipase C, um, uh, MAP kinase pathways, uh, and, and the signaling varies a bit from cell to cell. We got interested in this some years ago because we thought at the time that uh, the bulk of LPA and plasma and circulation was coming from activated platelets and that the release of LPA from platelets could be a way of platelets signaling with, with white blood cells, with the endothelium, um, in the context of, of vascular disease. And so we got very interested in what the role of LPA was in the vasculature. And so it turns out that LPA has effects on endothelial cells where it tends to promote endothelial permeability, so it makes blood vessels leaky. It has some effects on monocytes. Um, there are reports that it promotes lipid uptake in monocytes. Uh, we and others have demonstrated a role for LPA in smooth muscle cells. It causes them to dedifferentiate. Uh, we and others have demonstrated a role for it and its receptors in the development of intimal hyperplasia in animal models. And then it's a weak activator of platelets, and, and um, particularly with, with low doses of other platelet 
platelet uh, agonists is very synergistic, um, working largely through um, G-alpha-13 pathways to activate Rho. But certainly, a, a number of these of the signaling pathways that have, been involved, that have been described in vascular cells tend to support a role for this mediator potentially in atherosclerosis. And so this is sort of a cartoon that we came up with a number of years ago that just demonstrates a role for LPA. Um, I, I will talk with you briefly about production of LPA, which uh, is largely through one, one enzyme. Um, LPA then that's produced extracellularly um, can, can act on platelets, it can act on smooth muscle cells, endothelial cells, really to promote the, the development and progression of atherosclerosis. And so again, here, a schematic of the formation of, of LPA. This enzyme autotaxin is responsible for the bulk of the production of circulating extracellular LPA. And here I need to be very clear and make a distinction because every single phospholipid molecule in a cell was, was at one point derived from lysophosphatidic acid. Um, and so when we talk about LPA, the signaling effects of LPA, we really are talking about the LPA that's produced uh, along the, the outside of the cell that is acting on G protein coupled receptors. And that LPA is by and large produced by a single enzyme called autotaxin, which is a lysophospholipase D. It cleaves lysophosphatidylcholine, uh, releases the choline to generate LPA, which then can signal through, through G protein coupled receptors. There is likewise a pathway for inactivation of LPA. And th this pathway is really what I'm gonna focus on for, for most of the talk today. Um, this pathway for inactivation involves dephosphorylation, so the terminal phosphate of the, of the lipid is cleaved to generate monoacylglycerol. This compound is receptor inactive, and, uh, and therefore it's thought that the enzymes that dephosphorylate LPA, which are present along cell surfaces, uh, are responsible for terminating signaling through the G-protein coupled receptor system. Just to point out that the autotaxin uh, enzyme that generates LPA when it, is, uh, when it is knocked out in mice results in embryonic lethality, in part due to vascular defects. Likewise, when uh, one of the key enzymes that is involved in degradation of LPA is knocked out in mice, it also results in embryonic lethality, again, with, in part, a vascular defect. And so just to summarize a lot of work that, that we have been involved in um, that, that has looked at how LPA is generated, we think that what happens is that this enzyme autotaxin interacts with receptors along, oops, excuse me, receptors along cell surfaces. Um, this includes integrins and then other non-integrin proteins that localize the autotaxin where it can be generated, it can be cleaving lysophosphatidylcholine uh, to generate LPA in close proximity to its LPA receptors. It turns out that the reason that platelets um, are a good source for LPA is that when they become activated, they release enzymes that actually generate lysophosphatidylcholine along their plasma membrane. And so they serve as a great source for lysophosphatidylcholine uh, the substrate for autotaxin. So what is the evidence that this signaling pathway might be involved in atherosclerosis? So I'll talk you through just a, a couple of bits of evidence that come largely from experimental models, um, primarily in mice. Uh, so here's data just looking at plasma LPA levels in, in wild-type mice, in APOE-deficient LDLR receptor-deficient mice, either on a normal chow or on a Western diet. These are actually um, looking at chromatographs of the plasma separated by size, and so uh, higher fraction lipoproteins, VLDL, LDLs come out here, uh, HDL here, and then, and then protein here. Uh, you can see that there is LPA in plasma from wild type as well as APOE and LDL receptor knockout mice, a little bit higher levels in hyperlipidemic mice. Um, on a normal chow, those levels go dramatically up um, when the mice are fed a Western diet. 
Um, and in particular, so this is largely protein-bound LPA that's present in circulation of the mice. In particular, you can see with Western diet that the amount of, of LPA that's in the, the, um, the low-density lipoproteins uh, goes up. So again, VLDL, LDLs here in the APOE knockout and the LDLR receptor knockout. And so there seems to be an interaction between both hyperlipidemia and diet uh, that is causing an elevation of LPA levels under conditions where the animals are developing atherosclerosis. Moreover, if you actually look in atherosclerotic plaque, you can find elevated levels of, of LPA. Uh, the levels of LPA and plaque actually correspond with, with those in plasma, and so if you look in an APOE or an LDLR receptor uh, deficient mice, you see that LPA levels go up in the animals that are on a Western diet. And these are actually the different species, the different, um, the, the different fatty acids that are, that are comprising the LPA um, in, in the plaque. And then you can do mass spectrometry imaging to actually look at the LPA in plaque, and that's along here, again, different species of the L LPA that are actually being imaged uh, in, in the plaque. And so there is LPA that's present in plasma. It goes up when you, when you feed mice a Western diet. It also goes up in the atheromas. Uh, others have demonstrated that if you exogenously apply LPA to the, a blood vessel in, in a mouse, you can actually promote the development of atherosclerosis and that exogenously administered LPA is acting through LPA receptors 1 and 3. Again, more evidence that there may potentially be a role for endogenous or, or normally produced LPA in the process. And so while we've been looking at the role of LPA in, in vascular cells and thinking about it in the context of atherosclerosis, a study that appeared in Nature Genetics that really got our attention. Um, and it is a study that many of you may now be aware of, which was a meta-analysis of the then-performed uh, GWAS looking at predictors for coronary artery disease and, and myocardial infarction in humans. And so the authors had combined data from over 100,000 individuals that had, been done, that had been obtained in a series of, of GWAS studies to look for novel predictors for, for the development of coronary artery disease. They identified 13, and one of the 13 um, predictors came out in the gene PPAP2B. Um, so PPAP2B encodes a lipid phosphate phosphatase 3, one of those enzymes that I described cleaves LPA and inactivates it. And in fact, it's the one that when you knock it out in mice is embryonically lethal. And so again, just to remind you, this, this enzyme is predicted to have uh, the, the following topology where its active site is in the extracellular portion of the, of the, of the cell. Um, again, the enzyme will cleave LPA to generate monoacylglycerol, which is receptor inactive. And so in our cartoon, where we have autotaxin generating LPA that signals through its receptor, this enzyme sits on the cell surface. It will degrade this LPA into something that's receptor inactive, and we think, therefore, terminate this intracellular signaling. Um, again, schematically, autotaxin generates LPA, LPP3 then attenuates the signaling, and through a series of work, we've demonstrated that LPA promotes endothelial permeability, it induces inflammation, it's involved in smooth muscle cell migration and the development of neo-intimal formation in mice, and that, in, in fact, some of this may be regulated by LPP3. So then, how do these polymorphisms in PPAP2B, which encode LPP3, promote atherosclerosis, um, and are they doing this by affecting LPP3 expression? So it turns out that the polymorphism that was identified in the GWAS is ac actually in linkage disequilibrium with seven polymorphisms. They are all in the final intron of the gene. So they're in a non-coding sequence that is that is located here. 
And so we had a little bit of work to try to figure out, first of all, could we identify the, the risk allele? We're actually not sure if there is a single risk allele, um, but we have some evidence to suggest there, at least one of these may be a risk allele. Um, and what might these variants be doing? And so this just puts the, the gene in context of what was, what's known in terms of dynamic chromatin hotspots and enhancer sites from, from publicly available information. And so as we were approaching this, Chris O'Callaghan's group in Oxford was doing a very interesting study where they were looking for environmental-induced chromatin remodeling changes in monocytes. And so what they were doing was to take isolated macrophages and treat those cells with oxidized LDL, that's sort of their environmental stimulus, um, to, to cause the macrophages to become foam cells. So the macrophages will take up the oxidized LDL and, and in culture appear like a foam cell. And they then isolated DNA from the macrophages in the foam cells and cross-linked it with formaldehyde and then did um, analysis where they were looking at regions of the chromatin that were open. Um, so most of the closed chromatin gets cross-linked by the, by the formaldehyde um, and they were able to sequence the open regions. And when they did that, they were able to find uh, differences across um, across the chromosomes between the, the macrophages and the foam cells. And so here, um, using this fair sec uh, technique, they were able to identify a number of areas of differences between, again, the macrophages and the foam cells. They then lined these regions up and looked at what else was known about those regions of the chromosome. Um, and so they were able to line them up with histone mark sequences. Um, they also lined them up with polymorphisms that predict coronary disease. And one of the regions that seemed to be particularly active in the foam cell, but not the macrophage, was in this area that had one of the polymorphisms in PPAP2B. And so they contacted us, and we have together done a series of experiments that have recently been published that I will take you through to try to identify what might that polymorphism be doing. And so it turns out that the polymorphism that that, that was in the region they identified um, appears to be a CEBP beta binding site. And the, the minor allele, which is the protective allele for coronary artery disease, has, has one sequence within this predicted CEBP beta binding site. Uh, the major allele, allele has a, a different. If we looked at the ability of these two, region, the, these two sequences to interact with CEBP beta, what we found, so here are controls, CEBP beta binding to a, a consensus sequence, super shift assay, um, demonstrating that consensus sequence is able to, be, to bind. And the, the minor allele, the protective allele, likewise binds CEBP beta. The risk allele does not. So suggesting that that risk allele may be interfering with CEBP beta binding. We then went on to look at what happens in macrophages and foam cells, and we were able to demonstrate that there's an upregulation of the protein expression in foam cells. Um, you can see here, uh, treated with oxidized LDL by both Western blotting and also looking at enzymatic activity um, in, the, in, the, in the graph below. More importantly, when we isolated macrophages from individuals with either the risk or the protective allele, made foam cells from those macrophages, and then looked at LPP3 expression, what we observed was that the individuals who have the protective allele had more protein expressed when, when their macrophages were induced to become foam cells. And so that's led us to, <clears throat> before I tell you our model, I, I should mention that Jake Lucis's group has done something similar in endothelial cells and seems, sees a very similar pattern. So he has taken endothelial cells from a whole host of individuals and looked at gene expression profiles either at baseline or after treating with OxPC, which is sort of a variant of oxidized LDL. So it's supposed to be an active component of the oxidized LDL. And he has observed something very similar, that individuals who have the protective allele have higher gene expression than those who have the risk allele. And so that's led us to this model in which 
in, in individuals with the protective allele, in response to oxidized LDL, there's an upregulation of CEBP beta binding to this region of the gene. And this, in turn, results in an increased expression of LPP3, which we think has a protective effect. And in individuals who have that risk allele, the CEBP beta isn't able to bind. Um, and so the LPP3 isn't upregulated. And so we think inflammation then is going unchecked. So if that's true, then if we downregulate PPAP2B in experimental models, we ought to be able to promote atherosclerosis. And so before I show you that, that we've actually been able to do that, I want to convince you that this protein actually does get expressed in experimental models of atherosclerosis. And so these are aortas from LDLR receptor knockout mice on a Western diet. And you can see along the top panel that there is LPP3 that becomes expressed in the atherosclerotic regions of the aorta. This is a control that doesn't have atherosclerosis. And then this is a, a um, secondary antibody only control. Likewise, you can see here uh, using confocal imaging, um, smooth muscle uh, alpha actin staining, uh, LPP3 staining, and then overlap where it appears that some of the LPP3 is expressed in the smooth muscle cells. Uh, there is also uh, overlap with uh, podocalyxin staining, so some of the LPP3 is in endothelial cells as well. And so because it's broadly expressed and because the, the global knockout is embryonically lethal, we, we did inducible knockouts, and so we started with the MX1 Cre system where we were able to um, broadly knock down LPP3 by, by treating the, the mice at a very young age with PIPC, allowing them to recover, uh, and then putting them on a Western diet. All of these experiments are being done on an LDLR receptor uh, knockout background, uh, but for, for simplicity, I'm just giving you the genotype uh, at the PPAP2B or the LPP3 locus. So these are the flox flox mice. These are the mice that have the MX1 Cre recombinase. All of these mice are treated with PIPC, put on Western diet for 12 weeks, and then we're looking at atherosclerosis. So this is a takedown of the aorta. You can see here is the aortic arch. So the aorta has been cut open and splayed out in half. Uh, you can see here the atherosclerotic um, plaques that have developed. Um, you see particularly in this brachiocephalic, um, but lots of plaque along the, the, the aortic arch in the essentially control mice um, and more atherosclerotic plaque when we knock down PPAP2B uh, and then quantitated, quantified here um, looking at percent of atherosclerosis in the arch. And then again here using uh, confocal imaging where we're looking in green at macrophages in red at LPP3 expression, so you can see that there has been a, a global reduction in LPP3 expression, um, and there, is more, there are more macrophages that accumulate in these, in these aortas. In keeping with the fact that there's less LPP3, there is more LPA, so remember that LPP3 is degrading LPA, and so if it's not present, we would expect that, that there would be more uh, of the substrate. Um, which there is in these mice. So the, the atherosclerotic um, plaques contain more LPA. There is also an upregulation of inflammatory uh, genes, including CD68, IL-6. Um, and then if we look along the surface of the aortas, we see more ICAM-1 expression. Um, again, all features of heightened inflammation when, when this uh, protein is downregulated. This is not due to a change in cholesterol because total cholesterol number, uh, levels as well as lipoprotein distribution in the mice are identical. So that, that was all well and good, um, but it was, a, it was a broad global knockdown of PPAP2B. And, and we thought, based on the work that we'd done with Chris's group, that it was really going to be the, the foam cells that were going to be key because that's really where we were seeing this upregulation of protein expression um, and we had this beautiful story around what the polymorphism was doing. And so we made mice that, that lacked PPAP2B and granulocytes and we did that using the Lysim-Cree. 
And as we were doing that, we isolated macrophages from either the control or the lysim uh, cre knockdown mice um, to make sure that we really had knocked down protein expression. And so here are um, untreated macrophages. Here are macrophages after LDL treatment. And here are murine macrophages after oxidized LDL. And you can see that, that the levels of expression are low at baseline, but particularly uh, after we treat with oxidized LDL, there is really no change in, in PPAP2B expression in, in what are now these foam cells. And so we were excited. We had the system working. We had put the mice on a Western diet. We took them down at 12 weeks, and lo and behold, there was absolutely no difference in the development of atherosclerosis. So we don't, at this point, think that at least in mice, the role of PPAP2B really is in the macrophage foam cell um, uh, formation. I showed you, though, that when we did confocal imaging early on, looking at where LPP3 was expressed, a lot of it seemed to be in smooth muscle cells. And so we knocked it down in smooth muscle cells. And when we did this, we now then had a atherosclerotic, a, a pro-atherosclerotic phenotype. In fact, it's, it's, if anything, a little bit more than when we just knock it down with the MX1 Cre. Uh, here again, using confocal imaging, you can see um, in red is LPP3 and the control, uh, which is really largely gone in the, in the, the uh, SM22 knockdown. There again is more macrophage um, accumulation in, in the, along, the, along the aorta in the mice. Um, and then again, in keeping with reduction of, of enzymatic activity, there's more LPA present. And so I'll tell you right now what we think might be going on, and we have a series of experiments that were ongoing looking at this, is we think that it's possible that what LPP3 is doing is regulating phenotypic modulation in smooth muscle cells, um, where we know LPA plays a large role. And so just to, to kind of summarize what we think might be going on, so not only can monocytes and macrophages be stimulated to become foam cells um, via things like oxidized LDL or OxPAPC, it turns out that smooth muscle cells will assume a foam cell-like uh, phenotype. And there are estimates that within a plaque, this may account for anywhere between 1% up to maybe even 30% of the foam cells that are present. Um, and so if you treat uh, smooth muscle cells with oxidized LDL or psychodextran cholesterol, they will assume a phenotype that looks an awful lot like a foam cell. Um, they begin expressing CD68. Um, they have tissue factor and, and other things that look much more like a macrophage than a smooth muscle cell. And so we're wondering if PPAP2B might not be regulating this step rather than this step. And so I'll just end by summarizing and saying that we're, we're also continuing to work on the role of autotaxin and its production of LPA uh, because we think that, that it is really, by generating LPA, promoting atherothrombosis through cell migration, inflammation, proliferation, potentially thrombosis, and that then this enzyme I've been talking about, LPP3, is degrading the LPA and thereby stabilizing the endothelium, limiting inflammation, proliferation, and potentially having an effect on thrombosis. And so I will just end um, by saying that right now we're, we're looking at, at LPP3 as, as an atherosclerosis protector or suppressor, and that this really has been work that's been going on in my lab for a number of years by an awful lot of folks, um, including our collaboration with Chris O'Callaghan, and Diana Escalante, uh, who was really instrumental very early on in a lot of the experiments doing, um, uh, looking at, at LPP3 and PPAP2B in mice. And so with that, I will end, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Have you tested um, the, 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 the mice with the LPP deficiency in the smooth cells between um, like, like a wire injury model where you have um, 
uh, a very kind of direct sumo cell hyperproliferation in, proliferation in the absence of like uh, the cholesterol, uh, the lipids, uh, the increases in, in inflammation. So you're asking in the LPP3 knockouts, have we looked at smooth muscle cell phenotype? No, and in, 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 sorry, the, the, um, the, the mice where you have the LPP specifically deleted in the smooth muscle cells. Uh -huh. Have you tested like a wire injury model where you're, you're really... Uh, we have. So we have, and we've actually published on that. So if you, if you knock down the LPP3 enzyme in a black six background uh, and then do an injury to induce entomal hyperplasia, they have accelerated entomal hyperplasia. They have more inflammation in the blood vessel. Um, so, and, and so... At likewise, if you take smooth muscle cells out of those mice and culture them, they have heightened responses to LPA um, that we can attenuate if we put in a catalytically active, but not a catalytically inactive enzyme back into the cells. So at least the phenotype in cell culture is, is, requires enzymatic activity and we think uh, involves LPA, we don't know in, in the mice. But we've, so we've done all of that in a black six background and, and published that a couple years ago. Um, Are these interactions affected by um, Duchenne dystrophy? <coughs> Are these interactions affected by Duchenne dystrophy? After all, the cardiac muscle does contain dystroglycans. Uh, along the membrane. Do you know if... I, I don't know. Can, can I ask, is uh, these individuals that had this risk allele, uh, do they ha have, um, uh, has the LPA been measured in their circulation? We have not done that. It, it, it turns out that about 1% are homozygous and so it's about 10% of the population that's heterozygous. So we've we've had to screen a lot of people to identify the to come up with enough to get macrophages and we have not done all of the the plasma LPA analysis uh, yet on those people is uh, plasma LPA bound to HDL or to albumin that's a uh, good I mean, normal that's uh, question. a good question so we think normally it is bound primarily to albumin when we put the mice, though, on a Western diet, we see some that we think is in HDL as well. But we think normally the, that far peak is albumin. So most of it is protein bound and, and not in the, the lipoproteins. In order to see it in the lipoproteins, you really have to be on the Western diet. Yeah, so the, then it's different from sphingosine one phosphate, which is bound to HDL mainly. Right, APOM containing yeah, HDL. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's it's quite different. Thanks. Okay, where am I? Okay, so now we have um, three um, brief or short abstract presentations. This was sort of a competition by, um, by, by, by several who submitted um, abstracts, and we, uh, the committee, a committee, selected three top um, abstracts for presentation here. They were all top, okay? So the first is um, by Stephanie um, Novikovsky, Novikowski, okay? Sorry. Um, she's a fourth year PhD candidate in Christian Kastrup's lab at UBC. Um, and she uh, obtained a BSc in biochemistry at Queen's University in Kingston. Um, and she's re recently co authored a paper in, oh, I won't even try to pronounce it. You'll tell them. Okay, thanks. Describing the synthesis of RNA in platelets, you'll understand, using liposomes, and is cur currently working on developing new methods for the transfection of platelets. Okay. Stephanie. Uh, 
Uh, first off, thank you for inviting me to share my work with you today. Uh, so in the next five minutes, I'll briefly be telling you how I've been using nanoliposomes uh, to engineer platelets for the release and delivery of exogenous RNA. Uh, so as all of you or many of you know, platelets are really nature's delivery vehicle. So they store their contents, which include small molecules, proteins, and nucleic acids, protecting them from degradation in the bloodstream, and then releasing them in a local and targeted manner at sites of vascular injury. And this process is mediated through uh, platelet activation, which, as well as its well-characterized role in uh, coagulation, has also been implicated in a number of other physiological and pathological processes, including inflammation and uh, tumor malignancy. What this means is that if you could control what the platelets are releasing at these sites by controlling what's inside of them, you have the potential to modulate a number of different diseases. So this is an idea that has been explored with platelets, particularly in terms of nucleic acids. However, a major problem still remains, and that efficient delivery or direct delivery of RNA or nucleic acids to platelets remains a challenge. So there are only a couple examples of transfection with, of platelets with siRNA or microRNA. And while platelets have been engineered to produce exogenous uh, messenger RNA and proteins, this requires modifying the platelet progenitors. So while it's obviously the, a valid approach, it does introduce some limitations and challenges when it comes to using these cells clinically. So to address this problem, I asked whether I could use lipid nanoparticles to deliver RNA to platelets, and if so, whether this RNA can then be released and delivered to target cells upon platelet activation. The answer to the first question is yes. Uh, so I made lipid nanoparticles and used them to deliver RNA to platelets. Uh, so shown here is confocal microscopy images of platelets which are stained in green and the nanoparticles which are stained in red. You can see uh, the red nanoparticles localized to the interior of the platelets consistent with uptake of the nanoparticles. And for these experiments and for the rest of the ones I'll be talking about in the next couple of minutes, the platelets are all ex vivo. They've been isolated from whole blood or from human whole blood and are just resuspended in tyroids buffer while the nanoparticles, which are about 200 nanometers in diameter, are just incubated with the platelets in the buffer, and that's sufficient for uptake. I'll also confirm that the mRNA is delivered to the platelets. So this is just qPCR data of uh, nanoparticle-treated platelets. You can see when you incubate the nanoparticles in platelets, you do detect the reporter RNA that's encapsulated within the nanoparticles. And as a control, I've inhibited uptake of the nanoparticles using sodium azide. And when you do that, you do detect a decrease in the amount of RNA consistent with uptake of this RNA. Uh, since the end goal of this project is to create platelets that can be transfused back into the body and used clinically, I wanted to make sure these nanoparticles didn't cause significant platelet activation or aggregation. So I've done a couple of assays for platelet activity. The first just looking at P-selectin expression in the platelets after incubation with the nanoparticles. So I've looked at two different time points, both with only half an hour and a 24-hour incubation with the nanoparticles. And in both cases, there's no significant activation of the platelets in terms of piece leptin expression compared to the untreated platelets. I've also confirmed that the nanoparticles don't induce any aggregation of the platelets. So similar with the piece leptin expression, there wasn't any significant difference in terms of aggregation uh, in the platelets after activation with these nanoparticles compared to incubation with just PBS. Um, the other goal of this project is also just to create a general transfection method of platelets. So I've done comparisons to lipofectamine in both cases, as this is the agent that has been used with siRNA, siRNA delivery of the platelets. And they both behave similarly with actually in the shorter time span, lipofectamine actually inducing slightly more P-selectin expression. Uh, now, that, or once I knew that the platelets weren't being severely activated, I looked to see whether this RNA could be released, and which it can be. So I've done qPCR looking at the platelet release rate and the platelet pellate after incubation with these nanoparticles. You can see with thrombin activation, there is an increase in the amount of RNA detected in the release rate, a corresponding decrease in the pellet, indicating that the RNA I'm delivering to platelets with these nanoparticles can be released. I'm still working on characterizing this release in terms of uh, looking at other agonists and whether the RNA is are packaged into microparticles or not. So just to briefly summarize, uh, I've or I told you how I can deliver RNA to platelets using nanoparticles, and this RNA is released upon platelet activation. I'm now looking to see whether RNA can be delivered to other cells, and also whether the platelets themselves can just utilize this RNA for either de novo protein synthesis or RNAi. So with that, just thank my lab and everyone at UBC who's provided support for the project, and you all for listening. Thanks.
One question or three questions? Bernie, there's a question up there. Okay, great talk. Um, this is the ultimate question when it comes to drug delivery. But what percentage of the nanoparticles are taken up by the platelets? And just because you don't have anything targeted, like you don't have targeted drug delivery, and you know if you're able to do targeted delivery to platelets, period? Or So in terms what? of percentage of nanoparticles, um, Actually, now I can't remember. It's, I, I'm saturating the platelets, so all the platelets I know seem to be taking up nanoparticles. Yeah. In terms of the actual percentage of nanoparticles, I think it's fairly low. It's either 1% or 10%, somewhere in that range. Mm -hmm. In terms of the targeting, it's not two platelets. Um, that's why we're using the ex vivo, and the goal is more to use it in like apheresis units, where it's just going to contain platelets. I know for sure, actually, the other cell types, like macrophages, do seem to take the nan nanoparticles, because I can see that our preps aren't 100% pure. But the idea is so that we can use pure platelet preps and then not have to target to the platelets, just use the platelets for the targeting. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. That was two questions, Erica. <laughs> the next speaker is uh, Peter. Uh, he's well known to most of you. He's a clinical associate professor in the Department of Pathology and Lab Medicine at UBC and a research associate in the Canadian Blood Services Center for Innovation, working with uh, Dr. Dana Devine. Peter. Well, thanks so much, Ed. And of course, credit to my co-authors, Bran and Simi, who are sitting in the, in the authorship. And all the study is, of course, done in Dana Devine's lab. So as we are a research and development lab for Canadian Blood Services, our main interest is, of course, uh, research tailored around safety and quality. And who don't know what Canadian Blood Services does? It is a not-for-profit charitable organization whose sole mission is to manage the blood and blood product supply for Canadians, except in Quebec. So in order to constantly improve safety, in the last 10 years, so-called pathogen inactivation technologies were developed, which inactivate a variety of viruses and bacteria. But clinical and research studies show that these technologies also have a negative impact on the quality and the efficiency for transfusion. So these are the three common, uh, currently on the market available pathogen inactivation technologies, and I don't want to go in detail. We used the Mirasol system in this study, and what we usually do in a pool and split study, you're using two platelet concentrates, pool and split, and have one unit treated, one unit untreated, and Mirasol uses riboflavin as a photosensitizer and UV light, and we're collecting samples throughout storage in both study arms and do a variety of assays on quality and um, efficiency. So in this study, we were looking at an aspect that UV light is used in actually all three pathogen inactivation technologies, and this technology, this UV light, is used to tailor RNA or DNA of pathogens to terminate their growth. But as we know that platelets inherit mRNA from megakaryocytes, that might be targeted with that technology as well and might in part explain the reduction of quality and function. So that is what um, we use in that assay. Um, we're using puromycin, which is a translational inhibitor, which is known to be incorporated in newly synthesized protein when it comes out of the ribosome. And in order to um, purify proteins, which are newly synthesized, to analyze the impact of the technology on the translatome, we used a derivative of puromycin, which is a biotin puromycin that binds to the Nastin chain, and then it can be, that a biotin can be utilized to be purified on strapped arvidine beads. And these purified proteins can be digested with trypsin and can be um, analyzed in a mass spectrometric analysis. 
And here just to show that pyramidin is really incorporated into the uh, platelet uh, translatome is just showing the diff uh, throughout storage with and without the UV treatment, and you see actually an increase in pyromycin incorporation. And that was actually very surprising. So as I said, we digest these proteins which we um, analyze or which we purify by the biotin nulation and use mass spectrometry, and we identified about 50 proteins which span a variety of platelet functions, mitochondrial, cytoskeletal, and so on. And they are listed here by the grouping. And the proteins which are underlined in that table are uh, referenced in the literature known to be synthesized. So that demonstrates the validity of that approach. And these are the citations of uh, these papers. So in end, what we can show is Despite the fact that we were expecting that the translatome is going down throughout the treatment with UV, there is actually synthesis ongoing. That is very interesting and intriguing, and that actually adds to that whole knowledge of platelets, what we normally use or see in textbooks. So we should really consider calling that a platelet 2.0 knowledge that besides clotting, it is involved in immunity. I think that's mean well known. But it also plays a big role in mRNA translation and protein synthesis. And Andrew Weirich down in Salt Lake City is one of the pioneers who revisited, actually, that whole translational idea of platelets. And we can show, we did our experiments in our lab, showing that if you uh, inhibit that synthesis, it has a negative impact on platelet function. So that study, what we show here, is show that we really don't understand the platelet per se. So we need to further understand the biology of platelets on the protein synthesis and its role not only in our field, blood banking, but maybe even in platelet disease. So thanks to a fantastic lab that we're working in, all the dedicated donors which help us and donate just for research purposes, and um, the granting agencies which help to run these projects, and you for staying awake. Thank you. Thank you. Last speak, sorry, the last speaker before coffee, Aline Santoso completed uh, her Bachelor of Science, a Bachelor of Applied Science rather, at the University of Waterloo and a Master's of Applied Science in Mechanical Engineering at UBC under Dr. Hung Shen Ma's supervision. She's currently a research engineer um, in that same lab with an interest in microfluidic devices to analyze red cell um, deformability. Aline. Uh, first off, I would like to thank all the organizers to invite me to this talk and share my work with you. So um, the goal for our lab is to create a microfluidic device to analyze red blood cell deformability. So as uh, many of you here are already familiar with, red blood cell deformability um, plays an important role to squeeze this red cell through the capillaries. And changes in red blood cell deformability can be used as a biomarker for diseases such as malaria or hemoglobinomatity like sickle cell disease. Um, to, to make a device uh, that measures red blood cell deformability, we are inspired by the concept in gel electrophoresis, where DNA molecules are transported through nanoscale pores, and the final positions of the molecules indicate the length relative to the known control. Similarly, our microfluidic cell phoresis transports the red blood cells through microscale pores, and the final positions of the red blood cells indicate the deformability relative to the known control so more deformable cells will travel further along the device. So um, our mechanisms enables uh, on-chip loading, which means that only a small volume is required. It also enables us to parallelize a single array, um, a single array here uh, into using the pressure manifold into eight different samples, so we can run multiple uh, measurements of several samples. 
Um, this is a short video that shows how the device works. You can see a small pressure um, is used to yeah, is used to apply this um, to load the cells, and the excitant pressure is used to deform the cells through the microscale spores. Again, more deformable cells will travel further along the device. So I will stop it. <laughs> so uh, we use um, these mechanisms to analyze 10 blood bags over a period of eight weeks. Um, as you can see here, we observe small fluctuation, but no significant difference for the whole population. But if we look at the least deformable subpopulation shown in the red box here, and at the red and green line, the 10% and 5% least deformable population, there is a significant degradation of deformability after of four weeks of storage. Another um, disease that we analyze is the sickle cell disease. Uh, again, this is a 10% least deformable subpopulation, and we, um, we observe uh, different types of sickle cell disease have different signatures in deformability. Um, this is thanks to Junmei Wang collaboration with Bloodworks. <laughs> Um, another, another disease is um, we analyze the deformability profiles of infected red blood cells um, after exposure to antimalarial drugs. In general, antimalarials decrease the infected red blood cell deformability, especially the new drugs that is the PFATP4 inhibitors that show a very distinct biophysical signature compared to the rest of them. The only exception is the tetracycline, which is a slow-acting drug, um, that takes uh, 48 hours incubations to have an effect on. And this one is a negative control for the DHIQ, which shows no difference with the control. Um, again, as a summary, uh, our lab develops a microfluidic device uh, that is able to paralyze single cell uh, measurements of deformability, and it's, um, it can be used as biophysical assay. I would thank you. Thanks. Interesting work. I'm curious to know, in, in the slide that you put up where you were looking at different blood donors and, and sampling over the storage period, you had quite a spread on day one of storage in the, in the difference that you start with. And I'm wondering if you've investigated those, like that green donor, the red donor, have they got any underlying uh, disorder, or are you, is that the normal range? Is the spread that wide? So um, this. This is a period of for eight weeks for 10 blood bags. Um, the spread is due to the differences of red blood cell deformability from different donors. If you're talking about the variance here, is, is that what? Well, I'm talking about if you just look at your graph on the right, the, there's, you're, you have at least a two-fold difference from donor to donor, if I understand, your least and your greatest deformability. Um, the, the blue line in here indicates uh, the whole populations that we examine. Well, the red and the green line here indicates a subpopulation, so only a certain section of the population of red blood cells. So it's not actually donor to donor variance. Okay, so if you so so you are arguing then that you could actually use this as a screening test for quality control for red cells. Is that what you're trying to move toward? We are hoping that's a potential that can be that can be used. Thanks. So let's take a 20-minute coffee break. Do come back. We have two great talks, awards, judging awards, and then wine and cheese after. So I definitely wouldn't leave. All right, so um, 20 minutes. So we'll aim for 10 after, and we'll probably start after that. OK. OK, we're going to start. Dr. Davy is here. Whew. <laughs> All right, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Doug Seens. After um, fit, completing his uh, medical degree at NYU, um, uh, Doug uh, completed his training in internal medicine at the University of North Carolina and a fellowship in hematology oncology at the University of Pennsylvania. And there he remained, and they are lucky he did. Doug is a professor of pathology and laboratory medicine and medicine and a director of academic programs for the Department of Pathology, as well as the medical director of the Special Coag Lab. 
Um, his research is focused on the immunohematologic disorders with an emphasis on inflammation and thrombosis. His many publications, lots of excellent collaborations, particularly with Canadians, a lot of Canadians, but to West Coast, East Coast, um, and uh, we're pleased to have him here. Doug? So thank you, and uh, as like the other people who have uh, come before me here, I'm uh, very honored to have been invited, and I appreciate it, and thanks to Ed, and thanks to um, the folks who have organized this meeting. Uh, as Ed said, our lab is interested primarily in, in uh, inflammation and thrombosis, and in that, con in that con can you hear me okay? And in that context, um, one of the disorders that we've been studying for quite some time is HIT, or heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, which is what I'll talk about today. For those of you who are not familiar with this disease, this is a prototypic presentation, a patient who had a staph in his vein removed for coronary bypass surgery, had a calf, cabbage, two exposures to heparin, doing well. A week later, play the count drops and he develops uh, an ischemic foot, which will lead to a, a, a BKA, a below the knee amputation. So this occurs in about 1% of patients given unfractionated heparin, which if you do the calculations, is pretty close to 10,000 people in the U.S. per year, so it's not that rare. Mortality, amputations, very prothrombotic, very high incidence of recurrent thromboembolic complications. And therapy with direct thrombin inhibitors and fondaparinox reduces uh, recurrence by about 60%, has no effect on amputations and thrombosis and, come, and, and death and comes with a very significant risk of bleeding and thrombocytopenic post-op patients for which there is no antidote. So there's plenty of room for a better understanding of the disease and therefore rational interventions. Although this disease is called heparin-induced or heparin-associated thrombocytopenia, the disease is actually mediated by antibodies to platelet factor four after they bind either to heparin or we've shown cellular glycans. <clears throat> so the antigen is PF4. The objectives of my talk are the first half a mile high view of the pathophysiology of HIT and specifically our interest in this being a cell associated immune complex disorder. And then the second half of the talk I'll really go right down to the other level, the atomic level, and talk about the generation of the autoantigen in the context of a couple of questions, which is how, does, how do autoantibodies develop into a normal host protein in a normal host? And then secondly, why do only a small subset of those antibodies actually cause disease? We'll see if I can give you some insights. So let's talk about immune complexes and cell activation. So the antigen, as I told you, is platelet factor IV. Uh, this is predominantly, almost exclusively stored in the alpha granules of platelets. It's the most abundant protein they secrete when they're activated. Lots of folks are interested in the physiological functions of platelet factor IV, which are, some of which are listed up there. And, but for the point of view of of HIT, it's not interfering or modifying the function of PF4 so much as PF4 as an antigen. And the question is why PF4 among hundreds of heparin binding proteins should be the antigen in almost all cases of HIT. Oh, sorry, PF4 is highly cationic, it binds heparin and glycosaminoglycans on a variety of cells, but most importantly, I'm going to try to tell you it's an antigen because it spontaneously tetramerizes and super oligomerizes in the presence of heparin and the resulting antibodies. So a number of years ago, this is a space-filling model of platelet factor IV with the lysines and arginine shown in blue, and this is where heparin binds. Uh, a number of years ago, we, and I'm going to define we at the end of the talk, okay, so I'm going to say we at the moment. Um, we uh, made, did extensive mutagenesis of PF4, and we found that there were a number of residues which were absolutely critical for the binding of HIT antibodies. And of course, these were not next to the heparin region. So the question was, like, is why? And what, what, does this have, what does heparin have to do? Is this really the binding site? Are these structurally, indirectly related? What does heparin do to this region? Wh why should these amino acids? And we didn't, and you can see these are 10 years ago, so it's been a long time to try to understand why. Any explanation for pathogenesis has to take into account this phenomena, which is if you take platelets and you label them with C14 serotonin and you measure that as a measure of activation on the ordinate and you take a, a, an antibody, a hit antibody, and you incubate that with platelet-rich plasma at a, constant, a set amount of PF4 and you vary the heparin concentration, the antibody only activates platelets over a narrow molar range of reactants. And that happens in solution on platelets. And if you measure that happens on monocytes, so this is the binding of a, this is 
the addition of platelet factor 4. This is detection of platelet factor 4 by a polyclonal antibody. If you use a, a hit-like monoclonal antibody, again, it only detects a subset of, uh, of PF4 that occurs at a very narrow molar concentration range. So what's happening? Well, I don't know what's happening on the cell for sure, but I do know what happens in solution, which is if this is the migration of platelet factor 4 on an HPLC, when you incubate it with heparin at a one-to-one -one concentration, you form dimers of, of tetramers, and you also form these very large complexes that fall out of the, in the void volume of the column. And there are over a million kilodaltons on the column. And if you vary the concentration around one-to-one, -one, you no longer form these high molecular weight complexes. In fact, these complexes are so large, they actually form, they're actually micron size by dynamic light scattering. I won't show you that data, but they're huge, huge immune complexes. And they're easily visualized. These are by, studies by John Weisel. This is PF4. This is heparin PF4 at a one-to-one -one ratio. And this is at a heterogeneous ratio. So it's easy to see these complexes. They're so large. And these, what these represent are, are decorating with a, a secondary antibody to a, a monoclonal anti-heparin PF4 antibody. And so these form large immune complexes. And I'm going to show you some data, which I hope will convince you that these are, in fact, what's, what stimulates this disease and would differentiate this antibody from other antiplatelet antibodies that cause thrombocytopenia and bleeding. And I'm going to tell you that, <clears throat> that platelet factor 4 is in the alpha granules of platelets. It comes out and, and either binds back to the chondroitin sulfate on the surface of platelets, or it gets displaced by heparin, which is more negatively charged, that forms these larger complexes. This either binds back to the platelet, or if antibodies form, it activates platelets through FCR gamma 2A, going through the ITM6 signaling pathway. And the evidence for that is as follows. But for, oh, I have to tell you one, one step. I have to, in order to describe the experiment that establishes this, I have to tell you about two antibodies that we used in those experiments. And one that I'll talk about is KKL, and the other is labeled RTO. And these are products of the same monoclonal antibody production of mice immunized with human PF4 and heparin. They're both the same isotype. One is increased, the binding is increased to PF4 by heparin, one is not. Remarkably, they show the exact same KD in Bmax by ELISA, and they don't compete with each other. So I'm going to try to come back and to try to explain that at the end. This one I'll show you causes disease in an animal model, competes with human antibodies. It's published. I won't show you it. And I'll show you it's pathogenic in, in vivo as well as in vitro. So here's the model. Uh, mouse, mice don't have FC receptors on their platelets, so this mouse was rendered transgenic for human FCR2A, which is the platelet F, only platelet FC receptor that we know of. This mouse had its PF4, endogenous PF4, knocked out, and human PF4 put in. Mice were crossed. They were injected with this RTO or the control, R, uh, KKO or the tr uh, control anti-PF4 antibody, and then the mice were heparinized. And if you look at the platelet count in the double transgenic mice, the platelet count drops by 80%. In the single transgenic mice, it doesn't happen, and with the RTO, it doesn't happen. So what, that's thrombocytopenia. In terms of thrombosis, if you inject these mice with the antibody in saline, this is their lung, that looks fine. If you then heparinize these mice, they develop thrombosis in the lungs, brain, the adrenal glands, all over. They die the respiratory and cardiac and shock death within a matter of minutes. So having FC receptors in there and having human PF4 is critical to the path, I think, critical to the pathogenesis of this disease. So these immune these antigen antibody complexes not only bind to platelets and, and therefore stimulate through the FC receptors when antibodies form, but they also, we've published many years ago that they bind to the endothelial cells, they didn't do that human antibodies fix complement. Um, uh, the tissue factor is expressed on the endothelium, platelets adhere to the endothelium, and I'll show you some data that the same thing happens on monocytes. So these are, although they're antiplatelet antibodies, they're far more complex because of the heterogeneity and binding in terms of which cells they activate and, and how this contributes. This, this, is, this is an electron micrograph by, by John Weisel of some monocytes, nice, fluffy, happy outside. <clears throat> you had some PF4, most of them are happy. A couple of guys get a little bit angry. If you add antibody, however, if you add the pathogenic antibody, you can see what happens. These things vesiculate their surfaces. They start shedding very quickly. And if you uh, take a, a step back, these are, are procoagulant microparticles that get shed off of monocytes. <clears throat> and as the consequence of this is that, these, that platelets get a dual signal. They get a, si a primary signal through the FC receptor, but then they get a dual signal because monocytes also get activated, and we've shown by knockdown and and antibody experiments, they also get 
activated by FCI gamma 2A, express tissue factor, thrombin PAR1, and that signal signal uh, lens uh, expresses PS and allows the platelets to bind factor 10A. So they get a dual signal typical of procoagulant coated platelets. So this is again different than normal plate, other platelet antibodies. <clears throat> so that's, that's a mile high view of the pathophysiology. But now, for the rest of the talk, what I want to get into is what we've been doing more recently, which is to try to understand the formation of the autoantigen. And this is part of this is predicated on the, on the following observation. The question is predicated on this. We did a study with the cardio, uh, the CT surgeons at Jefferson, in which, which we did a prospective study of 111 patients who got calf and cabbage. So they got two exposures to heparin. All heparin was discontinued right after the surgery. <clears throat> and we looked at the incidence of anti-heparin PF4 antibodies in these patients measured by ELISA uh, five days later. And 70%, depending on the definition of the criteria for, for positivity, if you, if you just look at the rise of antibody type of 0.2 ODs or more, 70% of people develop anti-PF4 antibodies after cardiac surgery, calf and cabbage. And this has been confirmed by other groups as well. And yet, not one of these patients developed HIT because they didn't have any <clears throat> heparin around at the time that the antibodies were developing. In fact, if you look at all the patients who develop anti-heparin PF4 antibodies, only a small fraction of those patients develop clinical HIT. So what is it about those antibodies? Is there anything we can learn from the, from the structure of the antigen and the induction of the antigen that helps us can maybe be able to distinguish this antibody from all those antibodies that form, question one, why, Question two, can we distinguish that one antibody from the others? <clears throat> well, one property, one thing that's known about PF4 is that approxim the negative charge allows the cationic tetrabis to come together. A second property is that the antibodies that are pathogenic do the same thing. They enhance tetramerization. So this is an, a simple, really, a very simple experiment in which we just incubated that pathogenic antibody with platelet factor four, no heparin in this. Here's PF4 alone, here's PF4 plus that antibody. And the antibody itself is causing tetramers, super oligomerization of those PF4 tetramers. And then with cold, you compete. And with RTO, the control, that doesn't happen. So heparin is putting these together. Antibodies are putting these complexes together. And that makes it very difficult to study the antigen because almost everything that you study when you're studying binding is you're really studying affinity. You're not studying affinity. And you really don't know how the antigen gets exposed because what you're really seeing is the ability of heparin to form these tetramers, the ability of these antibodies to cross-link, and so you're measuring avidity. So almost every study you see is going to be an avidity study and not an antigen antibody study. So we wanted to get around that by using fag fragments of these monoclonals and by using the pentamer from the paranox, which binds to antithrombin-3, causes its anti is sufficient to initiate at least some of its anticoagulant activity, induces anti-heparin PF4 antibodies in recipients, but doesn't cause the disease except rarely because it can't form these large complexes. So we thought that by looking at fab fragments and from the paradox, we had a better shot at looking at the very earliest events in antigen expression. <clears throat> so the mechanism of antigen formation is unknown. Does heparin induce neoepitopes in PF4? Does neoepitope specificity distinguish pathogenic and non-pathogenic antibodies? Can we use this knowledge to screen for pathogenic antibodies? In fact, can this knowledge be used to treat HIT? That's pretty grandiose. But we, we got engaged with Mark Green's group to look at the structure of the crystal structure of platelet factor four, uh, which is partially shown on this slide. And there's a tremendous amount of information, but I only want to make a couple of points. Platelet factor four is an asymmetric tetramer. If you look at the, the C-terminal regions over here, they're further apart than they are on the other side. There's an open end and there's a closed end. And that has two meanings for us. One, the amino acids that we showed earlier in that earlier slide that were invariant in terms of the necessity, I couldn't substitute mouse for human in, 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 without destroying the antigen, they're all in here. They're all in right here. Secondly, the fact that this is an asymmetric tetramer allows only two Fonda Paranox molecules to fit one PF4 tetramer. So the concept that these are, that heparin, the longer heparin, wraps around this molecule, probably not true. And I'll show you what I think is happening. So this is the crystal structure of PF4 with Fonda Paradox. There are two Fonda Paradox molecules that you can see in the structure of the PF4 uh, tetramer, and they bind right next to the 
uh, positively charged residues. And what's interesting is, <clears throat> well, I find a lot of things interesting, but I th I'd like to interest you in the fact that this, this Fonda paradox cannot, not only, not only does this PF4 tetramer bind two, but this Fonda paradox can bind this PF4 and this PF4, et cetera. And this one can bind this guy and the next guy, and this guy can bind this guy and the next guy. And so if you perpetuate that, if you think that what's happening is that, what we think is that's happening is that PF4 is rigidifying a certain region within, within, that, within that PF4 molecule, when it binds, it rigidifies, and so it's not flexible, it's not looping around, it's not wild like, as it might be in solution. And that, that what's happening is if, if you extend that concept to linear, to heparin, a longer chain heparin, if, if this is valid and, you can, and if you can extend this model, then what you get is this li more linear extended structure of heparin. And here you have one tetramer and another tetramer and another tetramer, and you can begin to see how this could go on to the point where you get one micron uh, diameter uh, my, uh, antigen antibody, uh, antigenic complexes seen by uh, DLS. We then did the stru crystal structure of the FAP of KKO along with PF4. And what's interesting here, this is, the, this is the heavy and light chains, and looking just at 90 degrees, it's not a conformational change, it's just a 90 degree view of the same uh, idea. You can see that the CDRs make contact with three of the four monomers in the PF4 tetraper. So in order to get high affinity binding, something has to put the PF4 monomers together. That's what heparin's doing. And that's why a pathogenic antibody sees PF4 differently in the presence of heparin, because the PF4 tetramer is in equilibrium with dimer, is equilibrium with monomer. But in the presence of heparin, it's forcing it into this direction. And when it's in this direction, you get optimal binding, whoops, of the CDRs, sorry. You get optimal binding of the CDRs uh, to platelet factor four when you're a pathogenic antibody. And we've previously published that hu human hit antibodies in patients who have clinical hit by demographics, positive SR serotonin release assays compete with this antibody. So it's a relevant antibody. And so then you can develop, a, this is a model, this is not a structure, this is a model based on two structures, the FAB PF4 and the Fonda Paranox PF4 put together and try to do energy minimization to see how they relate to each other. You would get this concept of this large, very large immune complex where the, the heparin chain is central to the assimilation of PF4s, which in turn are cross-linked by the FABs seeing the same regions on, on two of the monomers on, on, from different tetramers. Now, what about RTO? For 15 years, we were using RTO as a control irrelevant antibody. So we thought we'd throw it in here and get a trivial answer that it wasn't doing the same thing. Okay. Well, this is an HPLC <coughs> in preparation for that, just to make sure that we knew the conditions under which to do the experiment. This is an experiment in which we put RTO on an FPLC along with either wild type PF4 or a mutant that we had made that is dimer. These are dimers, and occasionally, uh, very, very rarely do they form tetramers. So these break up, of course, into dimers and monomers. And then we looked at the shift in the molecular weight of RTO versus RTO plus any of the species that would have formed from this. And the shift was only three kilodaltons, which is consistent with RTO binding to a monomer. And in fact, in the crystal structure of RTO with PF4, it binds to the monomer. In fact, it binds to the monomer at almost the same site as part of the KKO binds. But you can't tell from this, but it, these, where the, it binds, where the antibody binds, where RTO binds, prevents, it clashes with the ability of monomers to interact with each other. And so you can't form dimers and you can't form tetramers in the presence of RTO, whereas you must form tetramers in order to get binding of KKO which is the antibody that caused the disease in the mice. So RTO may not be simply an irrelevant antibody. Maybe it's actually a function inhibitory antibody, which is something we never thought about. So we see here <coughs> platelets activated by um, either hit, hit IgG from a human or for KKO, looking at the expression of P-selectin in the presence of increasing concentrations of RTO, and we've got inhibition of platelet activation measured by P-selectin or platelet aggregation measured by, by transmission aggregometry. And in fact, when we put these into our mice, 
we got the following results. So this is a laser injury model in which we injected uh, fluorosinated anti-CD41 to track the platelets in the clot. These mice were given, uh, were given an injury, a control antibody, and then injected with KKO, and the PF4, well, this is going to be presented at ASH, the KKO will, the PF4 is released onto the endothelium, more KKO binds, the clot gets bigger. In the presence of RTO, the clot gets smaller. So this RTO inhibits not only acti activation by hit antibodies in vitro, it blocks thrombus formation in vivo. And this is a quantification of a bunch of mice showing the effect of uh, RTO versus a control. So I had told you that these bind equally well in an ELISA, and I told you that everybody converts in an ELISA, and I told you only a few percentage of patients who are ELISA positive have hit. So what's going on in the ELISA? I think what's going on in the ELISA is, got, is that it's got every species possible in PF4. I think it's got the tetramers, okay, and they're bound to, some of them are bound to plastic, and so they have a, and the, and the heparin-like molecules. So some of them are in the cellular conformation that's relevant. Some are not, and some are in monomers and dimers, and they're seen just as well. And it may very well be the case that a lot of the patients have their relevant antibodies, and in fact, a lot of patients with anti PF4 antibodies may have blocking antibodies. And maybe that's why they don't develop HIT, and that's what we're trying to pursue. <clears throat> so I'd like to tell you from the, <clears throat> these studies that um, this, is, this is the model that we are following that PF4 tetramers can, are asymmetric, that they break up into dimers and monomers, and this can be shifted in either, it's shifted in this direction by heparin. It's further shifted in this direction by antibodies that can see portions of two tetramers. And then when that happens, you get very, very, very large immune complexes that can act, cross-link and activate FC receptors, not only on platelets, but on monocytes, which can then generate thrombin. How they activate endothelial cells, I don't know, besides complement and eventually you get the disease called, that we call HIT. So I would, just before I, I stop, I'm, we're in the process of, of humanizing this. We're in the process of making monomers that we think may be inhibitory molecules, and then there are other approaches that folks here are interested in, in, wa in ways that maybe we can break up PF4 monomers and, and, and keep them from um, uh, assembling into a, a pathogenic immune complex. So I'd like to close by acknowledging Oh, a lot of people who did this work, <clears throat> including folks from my laboratory, Mark Green's laboratory, and th with the help of the Brook folks at Brookhaven in terms of the crystallography, um, my long-term collaborator, Morty Pons, who did all the animal work, and Steve McKenzie and Gao Arapali, and I needed to add John Weisel, who did all the electron microscopy, and of course, I'm th thankful that I have su NIH support, and with that, I'm, I'm happy to take any questions. A very, very odd disease. So in the serotonin release assay, you increase the amount of heparin, and increasing the amount of heparin in the serotonin release assay that I was involved in developing, I've never understood why increasing the amount of heparin yeah, I, changed the message. It breaks up the complexes. I see. Okay. It literally breaks up the complexes initially, and then at even higher concentrations, it forces the complexes off the cell surface by competing with endogenous glycosaminoglycans. So, um, Fonda Paranex, we are a little mixed in whether we should be using it as a treatment for HIT or not. Uh, I think mechanistically, you, it, it seems from your models, it could theoretically cause HIT if, if you get just the right stoichiometry and, and march up that long chain, right? Would you ever use it? We do use it. <laughs> um, uh, and, and it's because of the alternatives, right? I mean, it, you're not using it because it's the perfect drug. You're using it because the alternatives have a serious downside with patient bleeds. Um, fortunately, we could never demonstrate um, ultra-large complexes in vitro with Fonda Paranox at any concentration, including orders of magnitude above and below what's used okay. therapeutically. And others have reported that it's very capable of inducing antibodies that cross-react with, with PF4 heparin, but patients, with rare exceptions, right. don't develop HIT, I think because they don't make giant complexes. Yes, very complicated. Uh, am I, am I remembering more complexity that 
PF4 is cleaved by thrombin and converted to cytokine function? Uh, I have to check. I don't remember, to tell you the truth. I mean, PF4 as a cytokine <clears throat> is itself controversial because of the high, very high concentrations that are used in those assays and I the see. absence of an identified receptor. Uh, it interacts with um, NAP2 and IL-8 and modifies their function, that's for sure. I don't, I, I would have to check on the question you asked, and I will, but I don't remember. I, I will don't defer know. the rest of my question, therefore. Okay, sorry, don't know. I, I just don't know. But I can see where you might be leading. Okay. Okay. Okay, I'm going to let you set up while I say a few words. So our last speaker, not, not the least, is Braden McDonald. He completed his uh, Bachelor of Science at McGill University, that's in Montreal, in microbiology and immunology, and then moved west to the University of Calgary, where he completed his, an MD and PhD in immunology under the supervision of Paul Koobs. Um, Braden's PhD thesis examined the molecular mechanisms of neutrophil trafficking and effector functions within the liver and sepsis and sterile inflammation. He is currently completing his um, internal medicine residency here at UBC. I'm not sure how he got off um, today, but continues to be active in investigating the links between uh, NETS and development of DIC in severe sepsis. Braden. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dr. Conway. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. I'm actually filling in for one of my colleagues who is unwell. If any of you saw the original schedule, his name is Craig Jenny, and if you know him, he's doing fine. Just wanted to put that out there. Um, so I'm really happy to be here today to talk to you a little bit about some of the work that we've been doing in the lab, looking at the role of platelets in coagulation and infection. And specifically, <clears throat> we have an interest in sepsis. And as you're all well aware, sepsis is fundamentally a syndrome of systemic inflammation that occurs in the context of infection. And while inflammation is the central feature of the pathogenesis of disease, there's crosstalk with many other systems. And, and what we've become interested in is the crosstalk between inflammation and the coagulation and thrombosis systems in sepsis. And the disclaimer is that my background, is, as Dr. Conway mentioned, is in immunology, and, and most of the research that I've done in the past is in neutrophil biology and studying the mechanisms that allow neutrophils to find their way to sites of inflammation. And so we've developed a lot of in vivo imaging techniques to understand the biology of neutrophils, and, and these in vivo imaging techniques really rely on the use of high-resolution confocal microscopy to visualize the tissues of live anesthetized animals and through the use of various fluorescent probes and reporter genes we can um, visualize the the action of the immune system in situ in the tissues uh, as it's occurring and now as this technology has become more sophisticated we're able to begin studying the crosstalk with other biological systems and so that brings us to our ability to now look at the linkages between inflammation and coagulation using these methods. And so I'll start with some of the studies that we've um, completed that have looked at some of the functions of platelets in sepsis. And really this research began just with some observational experiments. So in these experiments we were simply visualizing the microvasculatures of septic animals and and comparing those to healthy animals and looking at what the platelets were doing in the microvasculature. And so on the left you can see a healthy control and this is the liver microvasculature composed of this dense network of sinusoids and platelets are flowing freely through the vasculature and then on the right is an animal with gram-negative sepsis systemically inflamed, many neutrophils shown in, in green recruited within the, these small blood vessels and then when we look at the platelets they're forming these large aggregates throughout the microvasculature and they appear to be very dynamic forming and releasing and another interesting observation is that a great majority of these aggregates are actually appear to be nucleated on the surface of the neutrophils and so this led us to believe that there was 
at least some sort of important functional relationship between platelets and neutrophils in the microvasculature. And it wasn't just in the liver that we were seeing this. This is a video of the pulmonary circulation of a septic animal that has ARDS. And the neutrophils are in blue. And you can see that those neutrophils that are within the microvasculature, again, are undergoing these dynamic interactions with platelets upon the, the surface of these adherent neutrophils. This is a video of the brain microvasculature in a septic animal. And in this post-capillary venule, where neutrophils have adhered to the endothelium, it's a bit fuzzy on the screen, but you can, you can appreciate that these red platelets are again forming these aggregates on the surface of neutrophils. And so we can see that within these septic animals, there's this dynamic collaboration between platelets and neutrophils. And, and these observational experiments really were hypothesis generating for us and, and led us to ask a couple of questions. Firstly, what are the signals that stimulate this interaction and what are the molecules that allow these cells to, to collaborate? And secondly, what's, what's the function of this very profound um, response that we're seeing in the microvasculature between cells classically thought of as, as hemostatic elements and cells of the innate immune system? And so, to start with the first question, which is the signals that cause this to occur, um, I'll come back to some of the work that was done by one of the postdocs in the lab when I was doing my PhD, Grace Ann Donaghy, who demonstrated that platelets express a functional toll-like receptor 4 on their surface and can respond to LPS in unique ways. And what we saw is that when we stimulate platelets with LPS, it induces this activity of their ability to bind onto the surface of neutrophils. And this could be inhibited by treating them with a TLR4 antagonist called erotoran. And a similar response was seen if we stimulated platelets with whole plasma that we re received from patients that had severe sepsis in the ICU. And again, this response was at least partially inhibited by blocking TLR4. So these results suggested to us that this activity of platelets that we were seeing in the microvasculature was actually a function of their ability to detect bacteria that were in the bloodstream. The second thing that we investigated was the molecular mechanism that allowed the platelets to then bind onto neutrophils and we found that it was dependent on a very specific adhesion mechanism involving an adhesion molecule called LFA1 and, it, and its ligand ICAM2 and we found that in animals where we either immunoneutralized LFA1 or in animals that were genetically deficient in LFA1 we prevented the formation of neutrophil aggregates or sorry platelet aggregates on the surface of neutrophils and thereby prevented the deposition of all of these platelets within the microvasculature. So this snapshot of these series of experiments led us to two somewhat fundamental conclusions on, on some of the roles of platelets and sepsis. And firstly, it was that platelets really were functioning as immune sentinels in this system through their ability to detect the presence of bacteria or bacterial products in the blood which then activated them to undergo these dynamic interactions with neutrophils in the microvasculature. But of course, the second question was still around, which was what is the function of this response that we're seeing? And we took a rather simple approach, which was just to get rid of the platelets and see what happened to the host defense. And so in this sample series of experiments, what we did was took septic mice and compared those treated with control uh, anti-serum to those treated with the depleting anti-serum which removed all the platelets from the circulation and we found a rather shocking defect in host de defense when these animals lacked their platelets we saw that there was dramatically elevated levels of bacteremia and dramatic dissemination of infection from the primary site to other organs in the body indicating that that clearly platelets are contributing to some sort of host defense system that prevents dissemination of bacteria and likewise, if we left the platelets in the animals, but just inhibited their ability to bind onto neutrophils and interact with them, we saw a very similar phenotype where these mice had dramatic levels of bacteremia and significant dissemination of infection throughout the body. So this, this really drove home a, a third key role for the platelets, which is their ability to collaborate with neutrophils and form some sort of very potent intravascular defense system that uh, prevents the spread of bacteria via the bloodstream in sepsis. To understand the nature of this defense system, we'll take a little detour into neutrophil biology. And 
some of the neutrophil effector mechanisms that might be mediating this intravascular host defense system. And the classical function of the neutrophil is, is its role as a phagocyte, so its ability to engulf bacteria and particles and kill pathogens through various oxidative and proteolytic mechanisms. But I, I think that you can agree that in the setting of bacteremia, charging neutrophils with the task of chasing down, gobbling up, and killing individual bacteria that are whipping through the bloodstream is, is ludicrous. There must be a more efficient way that the body protects against bacteremia. So this, this brings us to a more recently described neutrophil effector mechanism, which was first described a little more than 10 years ago, called neutrophil extracellular traps, or NETs for short. And for those not familiar, what NETs are, are large webs of chromatin material, so DNA and histone proteins, that are expelled from neutrophils into the extracellular environment. And these webs of chromatin are coated in the antimicrobial contents of, of neutrophil granules. So they form these vast networks of extracellular nets that are actually very sticky and can bind bacteria and due to the presence of the antimicrobial proteins can kill them very potently in the extracellular space in a way that's much more efficient than having neutrophils phagocytose and kill bacteria. And so you can envision a situation where the neutrophils are acting like fishermen, catch, casting their nets into the environment to capture bacteria efficiently and kill them. And what we found was that in sepsis, these neutrophils shown in green were casting vast networks of nets shown in red throughout the microvasculature. And these nets functioned to capture bacteria and kill them very efficiently within the microvascular beds and tissues throughout the body. And what we found when we came back to the mechanistic aspect of this is that it comes down to the ability of platelets to bind to neutrophils that allows these cells to, to release the, the nets into the circulation. So when we model this system in vitro, and I'm very proud of this picture because these are my neutrophils making these nets. Um, when we model this in vitro and challenge neutrophils with the task of releasing nets, we found that they would only produce their nets under flow conditions if they were incubated in the presence of both platelets and LPS. And in fact, it was the platelets that were responding to the LPS in this system. And likewise, when we moved in vivo, we saw a similar response. When we removed the platelets from these septic mice, they were unable to produce nets within the circulation. And again, if we simply just uh, inhibited the ability of the platelets to bind onto the neutrophils, they had a similar defect in their ability to produce nets. So just to summarize this section here with a little cartoon, again, in the systemic inflammatory state of sepsis, neutrophils become recruited into the microvasculatures of organs throughout the body. They undergo a very dynamic interaction with platelets that have detected bacterial products and become activated. And this interaction stimulates neutrophils to release their nets into the circulation, which protects against the spread of bacteria via the bloodstream. And so I think these, these results really highlight the fact that platelets are much more than just cells of hemostasis, as you're all aware, but they're actually very critical to host defense and certainly in the setting of sepsis. And that platelets and neutrophils do this by collaborating to form this potent intravascular defense system through the production of nets. And there's been a, an explosion of research in the field of nets over the past couple of years. Um, and the function of these structures is expanding, and, I, and I've told you a little bit about some of the antimicrobial functions, but like any good immunological response, when it's produced in overabundance, it can damage host tissues and cause, cause uh, organ injury, and certainly that's a contributor to the pathogenesis of sepsis. And, and I was told just recently, I, I wasn't aware of this, but um, at the symposium last year, Dr. Wagner was here, and talked about the role of nets in thrombotic diseases, in venous thromboembolism. And it was actually her work combined with our interest in these structures in sepsis that led us to then start looking at how nets might contribute to pathological coagulation in the setting of sepsis. And so this work was really driven by the hypothesis that the release of nets that we're seeing within the vasculature activates intravascular coagulation leading to microvascular occlusion and organ damage and sepsis. And we were interested in studying this using our in vivo imaging technique so that we could look at it in the context of the immune response that we uh, 
um, have been investigating for a long time. And so we really just wanted to boil down this very complicated coagulation cascade into something that we could visualize and study in this complex biological system. So, so we, we boiled it down to the terminal component in the cascade, which is the generation of active thrombin. And in our animals, we used a quenched fluorescence probe, which for all intents and purposes, when we inject it into the mice, it will fluoresce green in areas where thrombin is active. So on the left is the liver microvasculature of a healthy control animal. Again, few neutrophils in the circulation. And compare this to an animal with gram-negative sepsis, systemically inflamed, huge numbers of neutrophils infiltrating the microcirculation. And we inject our thrombin probe, and you can see that there's substantial dissemination intravascular coagulation throughout the microvasculature shown by the activity of thrombin in these vessels. And so to begin testing our hypothesis of a link between nets and this intravascular coagulation in sepsis, we started just with some observational experiments to look at the spatial relationship between these structures. So again, the top panel, healthy control animals, uninflamed, few neutrophils in the, circulation, in the microcirculation, a relative absence of nets and no thrombin activity. Compare this to septic mice where they're inflamed, there are many neutrophils recruited into the small blood vessels. They release this vast network of nets throughout the microvasculature and this correlates with this very profound and disseminated intravascular thrombin activity indicating activation of the coagulation cascade. And when we focus in on this further and look at it in greater detail, what we've found is that it's within the areas where nets are produced that we see the greatest amount of thrombin activity. Similarly, when we look at the formation of fibrin, we again see co-localization with net structures. So these series of experiments led, it, led us to believe that there is at least a spatial relationship between these nets and the activation of coagulation in the microvasculature. But in order to really get at the functional relationship, our approach was to inhibit the formation of nets and observe the results on the coagulation system. So we inhibited nets in, in one of three ways. First, either enzymatically, by treating these mice with an infusion of DNAs to chop up the DNA backbone and dissolve the nets. Biochemically, through a collaboration with Glaxo and a small molecule inhibitor that they've developed for a key neutrophil enzyme that's required for the production of these nets. And then genetically, using animals that are deficient in this enzyme and therefore unable to form nets. And what we found was that by any means, when we quantified the amount of thrombin within the microvasculature of these mice, the inhibition of nets resulted in a significant reduction in the amount of intravascular coagulation, indicating a functional link between these, these systems. And then, of course, the functional outcome of this, as you would expect, is that there's improved perfusion through the microvasculature when we've inhibited this axis. And indeed, again, mice treated with IV DNAs to remove the nets, we see significantly less thrombin in the microvasculature compared to placebo-treated controls. And when we infuse a fluorescently labeled contrast dye, I think you can appreciate that there's dramatically improved perfusion through the microvasculature. And this is just demonstrated here quantitatively with graphs, um, again, looking at animals where nets are inhibited either with DNAs, a biochemical inhibitor of their ability to produce nets, or animals deficient in PAD4 and therefore unable to produce nets. And in each case, we see a significant reduction in the fraction of small blood vessels that are occluded in, in the organs of these animals. And finally, we looked at serum biomarkers of end organ injury, and this is just a sample of the data. And what we found is that, again, when we inhibit nets and thereby reduce the amount of nets-mediated coagulation that's occurring, we see reduced levels of serum biomarkers of organ damage, in this case ALT to indicate liver damage, and reduced levels of serum lactate. And just to drive this point home, we're able to reduce lactate levels in these animals with severe sepsis by more than 50% without volume resuscitation, without antibiotics, but just by infusing DNAs into their circulation to, to disrupt this pathological mechanism. So I'll just summarize here again. We see that the neutrophils that become recruited into the microvasculature of organs and sepsis undergo this very profound 
and dynamic interaction with activated platelets, and this act interaction causes them to release nets into the circulation, and these nets precipitate the activation of coagulation, resulting in microvascular occlusion and organ damage, indicating that nets are key pathological mediators in disseminated intravascular coagulation and sepsis, and importantly, that inhibition of nets can reduce coagulation, improve perfusion, and attenuate organ damage. And I think, I think this really identifies a potentially important therapeutic target for patients with severe sepsis, and particularly those that are complicated by pathological coagulation. So I'll just finish with a couple of general conclusions from, from some of the work that we've been doing, and, and I think that for me it was a bit of an eye-opener, especially someone who didn't have a background in platelet biology or coagulation, um, that platelets are, as you know, much more than just cells of hemostasis, but in fact contribute to the immune response in a number of settings. And secondly, that these structures called nets that we're learning so much about in, the, in recent years are actually critical mediators and a critical link between the pathological entities that we've known for a long time contribute to sepsis, that being inflammation, coagulation, and thrombosis. So I'll just end by saying that there are lots of people to thank. I won't identify everybody. Um, many funding sources to thank for this work, and of course, you all for your attention, and I would welcome any questions. Thanks. It's terrific, and the graphics are spectacular, so congratulations. Thank you. You have a yin and yang here. Mm -hmm. uh, if you eliminate the nets, the bacteriuremia goes out of control. Mm -hmm. If you keep the nets, you, the coagulation goes out of control. So mm -hmm. therapeutically thinking, internal medicine resident, your yes. next patient with sepsis, uh, do you want the nets or do you not want the nets? Well. I take, I, I take comfort in the fact that we're actually really good at treating infections. We, we, can, we can eliminate infections. What we can't eliminate is the immunological pathology of disease. So, you know, we haven't done the experiments in animals, but I suspect that we could overcome the immune deficits of lacking nets simply by giving antibiotics. So I think that it, it does hold promise, but only in conjunction with standard therapy, which would be antibiotics. Well, since I had the same question, uh, how confident are you that your antibiotics are still going to work when you take out the nets? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. That's the key. That's the key yeah. question. Yeah. Um, so it's sorry. The the question was essentially reiterating how how confident would you be that the antibiotics would work? Um, and so th this has been the issue in sepsis and many diseases forever. Is in many inflammatory diseases as well, is how do we design therapies that don't eliminate the biological or physiological function of the immune system while still targeting the mechanism of disease? And I think we don't have an answer for that with any of our immunosuppression medications that are available to us. But um, in sepsis, I think that we do have a very nice armamentarium of anti-infective um, substances and strategies with respect to source control, et cetera, that I think the ability to combat infection is, is less of a concern. And so while it still is a concern in some patients that have highly resistant organisms, et cetera, I think that ultimately many of the times what we see when patients are dying, especially those with septic shock in the ICU, it's not from the infection, it's from the body's response to infection. I was just curious, given the relationship between the nets and the platelets, and presumably this is somehow also related to the platelet count, mm -hmm. is it valid to consider revisiting the transfusion trigger for platelets, that we use a, you know, for a prophylactic trigger of 10,000, when your patient is septic, we take it up to 50? Yeah. Are we doing something in the wrong direction by giving more platelets to septic patients than we would to non-septic patients? It's an interesting question, and I think it's a testable hypothesis. I, I don't know what the answer is, but certainly what we see is that there's reciprocal coupling between all these systems. You know, platelets induce the formation of nets. Platelets also bind to nets themselves and continue to propagate the cycle. So it's, 
at this point, it just remains a testable hypothesis, but it's an interesting question. Uh, is it very nice talk? Interesting to see that actually DNA is inhibiting the uh, prothrombotic activity of the nets. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what are the limitations of DNA using in, in, in patients, or is it is it a is it can be a good therapy, or uh, what is your opinion on that? So. Clinically, it's used primarily on external body surfaces. It's used in patients with cystic fibrosis as a mucolytic. It's, it's used in patients with empyema within body cavities. But the only thing that I found in the literature where they've actually infused it into people was in a small case series of patients with lupus. And they gave these, pa these folks infusions of DNA so over a series of days. And, and the endpoints that they were looking at were serological markers of lupus activity, so anti-double-stranded DNA levels, antihistone antibody levels. Um, that was it. And I think it was nine patients that they, that they infused. And that's the only thing that I've ever read about humans receiving IV DNAs. Um, I'm not aware of any phase one trials that have started with with DNAs as a target for nets. I know that there's huge interest amongst biotech companies developing inhibitors of nets and various ways to target these structures. Um, if they are doing any studies, they're keeping the results close to their chest because I haven't heard anything yet. But I do know within those case series, there were no adverse effects reported in the patients that received DNAs. Do you have clues as to the uh, chemical signals involved? between platelets and neutrophils and the uh, DIC induction? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's what we're working hard on right now. Um, for a long time, we've been trying to understand how this interaction between platelets and neutrophils stimulates the release of nets. And at this point, we've really been excellent at excluding things, but we haven't been good at finding a factor. Um, we've looked at all of the things that platelets can release, um, and none of them seem to activate neutrophils on their own to produce nets. It does seem to be a contact-dependent phenomenon. The platelets have to bind to the surface of neutrophils, so whether it's some sort of mechanical event, um, which is a very difficult hypothesis to test, or whether it's a, it requires very high concentrations of a local mediator between neutrophils and platelets, um, it remains to be seen. We don't have the answer yet. And as for the activation of the coagulation cascade by these net structures, um, there are a number of groups that are investigating this, including Dr. Wagner's group. And it seems like there are many things on nets that can precipitate, coagulate, precipitate the activation of coagulation. Um, certainly in our hands, what we found is that histones are key. Histones are important players. And, and actually recently we've been toying with the idea of, of polyphosphates being important in this process, especially since there's such an abundance of platelets on these structures. And um, in collaboration with Dr. Esmond, um, using some of the reagents that he's developed to target polyphosphates in mice, we are seeing that, that um, they do play some role in, in activating the coagulation cascade. Okay, so we're um, almost there. That was a um, terrific day, I think uh, we'd all agree. Um, I do have a couple of, um, before we wrap up, I do have just a couple of announcements. First, the uh, winner of the uh, best poster presenta uh, poster is Abhinav Ajay Kumar. I'm, I apologize for that pronunciation. And is, is Abhinav here? Well, run down here. I mean, let's give him a hand. <laughs> okay. So now um, I just want to, before, I'm going to call up, um, where's Ross? I'm going to talk to, yeah, Earl, you'll get your time. Hang on there. Or one sec, one sec. One sec. Okay, first, I just want to thank, first of all, everybody, all the speakers. Um, it was a great day, and, and to, to everybody, the students and, and the whole world. Again, I'd like to 
thank the sponsors, all the sponsors, for supporting us here. I want to thank Hannah and Anna. I don't know where they are. They're probably still out working. The runners, the mic runners, thank you very much. And everybody else who has helped, really, um, it's uh, been a team effort. Um, Ed Prisdale, who is, I, I always lean on, and he continues to provide support along with the rest of the people. Um, before we finish, or before you finish, please complete the evaluation forms. All right, so now I'm going to actually call on Ross to sort of continue on, and then he'll take over here. So firstly, I hope you'll join me in uh, thanking Ed Conway for all the work he does for this uh, incredible meeting. <laughs> So I wanted to introduce Earl to those of you that uh, don't know he's the guy over here. Uh, I actually had the pleasure of working with Earl as a postdoc. I actually went from the University of Miami in the sticks all the way to this fantastic university, University of Washington. And Earl was really the mentor who showed me that you can do really good science, have fun, and especially be collegial. I always found the University of Washington was an incredibly collegial place where people help themselves. And it goes on to this day because Eddie Fisher came with Earl to make sure Earl drove properly on I-5 I on the way up here. And I, I just wanted to mention one story about Earl, and that is when I was, uh, I actually went off to a scientific meeting, came back, and in my mail was a deportation order from the US Immigration Service giving me two weeks to leave the country because I'd changed visas. And uh, I got this about a week after it had been delivered because I was out of town. So Earl then took the manager of the department to downtown Seattle, uh, spoke to immigration on my behalf, and he came back and he said, I started down here and eventually worked my way up to the top of this building. And this guy comes out with this massive book of laws and says, well, according to page 453, he needs to be deported. And according to page 1270, we can keep him. So I think we should keep him. And then not only that, Earl brought me a letter of apology from the US immigration apologizing for the error that they had made. And they're not known for compassion when dealing with aliens <laughs> such as me. So only because of Earl am I here in uh, North America and uh, not suffering under the current conservative government in England. So I've always tried to run my lab the same way that Earl did with collegiality and uh, helping others. We have the same amount of fun, except instead of pizza and ice cream, we tend to have beer. But apart from that, it's uh, the same. So I would like to invite Earl up just uh, to say a few words to everybody. And uh, please join me in welcoming him. So. I want to say just a, a few words about how much I enjoyed and appreciated and honored by these symposiums and particularly uh, Ross McGilvery who started them eight years ago and uh, they've been steadily getting better and better and all the time and we have a terrific group of speakers year after year. And when Ross uh, stepped down a little bit, we had Ed Conway and Pritzdall to take over most of the activity. And, and anybody that's organized a conference like this knows how much work it is. Boy, it's a lot of work. And <laughs> my deep appreciation and thanks to those folks. I would like to just also mention that 
over the years, we've had a lot of support from Noble Nordisk and now a number of other uh, companies that have provided financial assistance. And boy, that's also been very, very, very helpful to make these programs successful. So I kind of feel quite humble about this series of just terrific uh, seminars and speeches and many thanks to all the speakers. They've been terrific and I'm delighted that we've had all these students participating because this is part of the scientific community that we all love. Thank you very much. Earl. That's good. Down? Yeah, you can sit down. <laughs> Me too. So each year we give a, a plaque to the, um, to the keynote speakers, and, and you'll get yours. But this is the first time we're giving one to Earl. It's a little heavy, all right? And what I'd like to do is I'd like to call up Bjorn and Ken um, to grab a seat beside them. Wow. Okay. Bjorn. Should I get these right? Oh, yeah. And that's Ken. Wow. Make sure you got them. Okay, and how about some pictures there? There you go. Great. <laughs> Terrific. Okay, good. All right. So, thank you. That's great.